George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. A week's a long time in politics, as Harold Wilson famously said, and Joe Biden and Boris Johnson have just found that out all over again. All it needed in the United States was a Supreme Court judgment that has unleashed the terrible firepower of the liberals in pussy hats in every corner of the union over the Roe versus Wade abortion row, a new culture war battle that the Democrats will hope will at least mobilize their natural supporters to the polls in November. In Britain, it was a couple of disastrous by-election results, oh, and a series of national rail strikes whose leader, Mick Lynch of the Railway Workers Union, has turned out to be, well, twice as popular as the Prime Minister in the country and exponentially more popular than the so-called leader of the so-called opposition, Sir Keith Starmer. We'll be looking at all of these issues the night. And we'll be looking at Ghislaine Maxwell's case as she faces up to 30, maybe 50 years incarceration for her filthy crimes. We'll be talking to one of the very first victims of the Epstein-Maxwell gang. And we'll be looking at China and Russia and the BRICS as they wrap up their successful summit with a new application by Argentina this time to join the original framework. And of course, no show would be complete without a tour de horizon of the disastrous NATO war in the Ukraine. So this is the mother of all talk shows. It is the Open University. There are no tuition fees, but I'll be asking you to donate via Super Chat if you can, so that we can get the midweek mother of all talk shows back on the air. And as a first priority, getting our podcast back up and running. It was once a chart breaker in almost every country in the world. We had to close it down with a heavy heart. We want to get it back up with a spring in its step. So fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be the usual bumpy ride because, hey, it's the mother of old talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. The hypocrites are on the march on the Potomac and indeed throughout the United States of America. Millions of people, pussy-hatted or not, are on the march against the Supreme Court of the United States, which has ruled not that abortion is illegal, but that it is not a constitutional right, and that for decades the United States, on the, they say, false, failed premise of Roe versus Wade has been pretending it was a constitutional right when it was not. And it now goes back to the states and the people as to whether abortion should be permitted and what the laws should be that cover the issue throughout the United States of America. Just to put my own cards on the table, I myself do not believe in abortion, but I'm not trying to change the law for anyone else, and certainly not in the United States. This is the very epitome of a domestic matter. This is the United States' own internal affair. But I am entitled to point out hypocrisy when I see it. Because amongst the pussy-hatted liberals and Democrats, that are marching for 
the right to choose are first of all an overwhelming number who denied that right to choose to millions of Americans when it came to the forcible vaccination against the coronavirus. Millions of these pussy hatters were amongst those who said, like Justin Trudeau, that if you don't get vaxxed, you won't be able to go out for a cup of coffee. You will not be able to go out for a meal. You'll not be able to travel anywhere or visit anything or go to any event. And if you're a trucker in Canada, you will not be able to cross state lines if you cannot prove that you have been vaccinated. So bodily autonomy now claimed by these pussy hatters was not something they granted to those who informed, refused their consent to the idea of forcible vaccination of an untried vaccine. Secondly, millions of these pussy hatters have been telling us these last years that a woman was not something that could be defined, that a woman could actually be a man identifying as a woman. But suddenly the air is thick with women's rights, the very rights that they took away from women to their own spaces, their own changing rooms, their own sports, and their own status as women. The word woman had disappeared from public discourse and from the names of wards and sections of hospitals throughout the Western world. We were no longer breastfeeding, but chest feeding. You were no longer a mother, but a birthing parent. But when it comes to Roe versus Wade, millions of them are out there shouting about women's rights. Thirdly, millions of these pussy hatters think nothing of voting for scores of billions of dollars of their own country's money to be spent on weapons of war and death that massacre other people's children in other countries, including Afghanistan, and, of course, of late, including in the Ukraine, in the NATO war against Russia on the territory of Ukraine. These hypocrites care nothing for children or women in the countries overseas that they bomb, invade, and occupy. Indeed, they are gung-ho, straining at the leash to kill women in other people's countries in the name of the United States Empire. Fourthly, as I said, it does not mean that abortion is abolished, but it does mean that abortion is now a matter for individual states in the United States of America. I have no view about that. I merely opine that you cannot abolish abortion. Abortion will happen whether it's legal or it's illegal. The question is, safe abortion. The question is, abortion when? I myself uh, have always in Parliament sought to bring the upper limit down. Twelve weeks would be the uh, maximum that I would support in legislation, but that's nothing to do with Roe versus Wade, nothing to do with anybody else, nothing to do with the United States of America. This is a matter for them. But it has lit a torch. And that torch, the Democrats are already brandishing, at least on the internet. But here's the rub. If the Democrats had wanted to enshrine the right to safe abortion throughout the United States of America, they have had decades in which to do it. They had the political power with which to do it. They are in control of the White House, in control of the Senate, in control of the House of Representatives. They could have legislated any time to enshrine that right to free abortion, stay safe abortion, the same kind of rules for abortion in all 50 of the states of the Union, but they did not do it. Why? because they are hypocrites, 
President Joe Biden is forever brandishing not torches but candles on his knees in Catholic churches, forever reminding the electorate that he is a Catholic of Irish extraction after all. But unless things have changed, the Roman Catholic Church is completely opposed to abortion. And guess what? So was Joe Biden in the 1970s at the time of Roe versus Wade. Biden opposed that ruling and has done nothing either to change his religion or tell his co-religionists that he no longer believes in a fundamental precept of the faith. He has not lifted a finger to ensure that the law was enshrined in the United States. And then there's Nancy Pelosi, another one, another one never done genuflecting on her knees. I don't mean her drinking habits. I mean on a Sunday, where she's never done telling people for electoral reasons how Catholic she is. Just a few weeks ago, she was out campaigning, moving heaven and earth in support of a democratic candidate who is campaigning for no abortions at all. These people make me sick with their hypocrisy. Now, of course, hypocrisy is not confined to the Democratic Party and not to the United States of America. Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, and his amanuensis, though his amanuensis is supposed to be shorter than him, and, well, David Lamy is vastly, vastly bigger than him. In fact, he gets bigger every day. He's looking like Idi Amin Dada, the former dictator of Uganda, the more I look at him. Both of them are out today saying they could not possibly countenance Labour members of Parliament standing on picket lines, even though pictures quickly emerged of both of them standing on picket lines. But those workers were white-faced, white-collared members of the University and College Lecturers Union, not horny-handed, blue-collar railway workers outside railway stations, picket lines in... Uh, Cloisters of the best universities are one thing, but picket lines outside Britain's railheads are clearly beyond the pale. Both of these purport to be leading figures in something that still calls itself the Labour Party, the party of work, of workers. But they have set their face against a group of workers who have taken the country by storm, not by force, but by force of argument. Britain's railway workers are engaged in the most popular strike ever known in this country of Britain. That's the most popular strike ever. 75% of the British people polled this week support their demand for an inflation level of wage increase. 60% support the strike itself. And overwhelmingly, people blame the government and the fat cats that run the railway companies for the fact that we have a dispute in the first place. Why is that? Well, because the British people are fair-minded on the whole. They know a good and honest and just cause when they see one. And they see that cutting people's wages because that's what a sub-inflation level wage increase means. Cutting the wages of people that worked throughout the COVID catastrophe, many dying, but who worked throughout so that the rest of us could continue to work and to move. That offering them a six, no, seven percent wage cut 
of a 3% wage offer when inflation is now virtually 10%, the highest for 40 years, the railway workers don't deserve a 7% pay cut. As a matter of fact, nobody deserves a pay cut when profits are bumper, when the billionaires are multiplying in front of our eyes and billionaires are becoming trillionaires, why should the workers who had nothing to do with declaring war on Russia, with the policy of, of lockdown that the people who own and run our country implemented, why should the workers pay for it? But there's another reason. The railway strikes are the most popular strikes ever because the leader of the Railway Workers Union, Mick Lynch, is manifestly written on every line in his face, detectable in every nuance in his voice, an honest and authentic leader of working men and women with no side not there to advance his own career, not there to attain office, there to serve the people who employ him, to stand up for them and to make their case as powerfully and as clearly as it's possible to make it. And my goodness, Mick Lynch has done that in spades. In the tradition of other great railway workers, union leaders, like Jimmy Knapp, the late and great Scottish railwomen's leader, who also led national rail strikes that were actually popular amongst the people who could see and hear the sincerity of his case in his grizzled face and his gnarled voice. Or Big Bob Crow, God rest his soul, gone too soon, who was the great railway leader who famously said when they were discussing the euro, whether Britain should join the euro, I don't care what's on the money, I don't care if it's the Queen's face or the Queen's arse, all I care about is how much of that money is going into the wage packets of the men and women that run the railways here in Britain. Mick Lynch is in that tradition. No nonsense, no flannel, no spin, just truth, just facts that he drives home in every television interview that he is given. It's said that the television interviewers are threatening to go on strike unless they are protected from having to interview Mick Lynch. It is said that Tory government ministers are begging central office not to put them up on the studios against Mick Lynch. Turning as I must because I have spoken too long to Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson faced two catastrophic by-election defeats. One to Labour, one to the Liberal Democrats on Thursday and it has created an earthquake inside the ranks of the Conservative Party. He didn't feel it yet because he took particular care to be out of the country when the results were announced. Where else would he be but out of the country? Whenever there's any trouble he's in, Kiev, Kiev, giving away even more billions of British taxpayers' pounds that are desperately needed at home that could solve the railway dispute like that. He'd rather give the money to the clown, Zelensky, in his disastrously losing war against Russia in the Ukraine. Boris Johnson, he'll go anywhere, even Rwanda, even Kigali, rather than face the music back home in Westminster in London because that music is increasingly a crescendo of calls for him to go. Now the familiar problems endure. Nobody wants Boris Johnson's Conservatives. 
but they don't fancy Rishi Sunak's conservatives either. Still less do they fancy Keir Starmer's Labour, who won a by-election on Thursday with the lowest Labour vote in the constituency since 1931, when Labour was wiped out after its leader, the apostate and traitor Ramsay MacDonald, deserted his party and went into a coalition with the Conservatives. It is said that six Conservative members of Parliament are about to travel in the opposite direction, where they will be warmly embraced on the Labour benches, where Jeremy Corbyn is not. Corbyn opened up this week about the role played by the intelligence services, the security services, and the British military in his downfall. And we'll be talking to the hottest journalistic property on this side of the Atlantic, Kit Clarenberg, about that during the first hour of this show. I told you it was going to be a bumpy ride, so Make sure those seat belts are fastened because this is the mother of all talk shows. You know, and it's a very thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate. Great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there. You know, I had a great mom. She was Scottish. Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food, I said to Melania. You know, haggis, look at that. What's more than more Scottish than that? Me, I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. The first poll of the evening is up there. Should Joe Biden step down as U.S. President? A, yes, B, no. That's running on my Twitter account. Uh, that's the one that is falsely stamped Russian state affiliated, about which they're about to hear still more from me in the courts in Dublin very shortly. And on my YouTube channel, finally, thanks to all of you, I've reached 200,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel. I don't know if I'll get the silver plaque I should have got when I reached 100,000, but didn't. But who cares? 200,000 was my target, and I thank each and every one of you. Uh, that's my YouTube channel. Do subscribe. And my Telegram channel, which is t.me forward slash George Galloway. You can vote on all three of those platforms. Now, uh, the fighting fund is coming in fast. Thank you for that. Zook Zookski donated five pounds, says, Good evening, George Zook. Good evening to you and many thanks as always. Dino Pantelukas donated $4.99, his weekly contribution, solidarity from New York. Thank you, Dino. God bless you. Our Sultani donated £1.79. Gemma Jane Brooks donated £1.79. Albert Sontag donated US dollars 35. Thank you, Albert. Linda Petit donated 10 British pounds. Thanks, Linda. And MGTOW Gem donated Australian dollars, $7.99. Philip Hall donated five pounds. And he says they might temporarily win with an information war, George, but they can't win a knowledge war. Thank you, Philip. And Dan Zed donates 10 US dollars, says, Sir Gigi, thank you for all the work you do. Well, Dan, I couldn't do it if it wasn't for you. Please, everyone, spread the word about the mother of all talk shows because we have the highest quality of guests and calls and some half-decent rhetoric from yours truly. Mubarak Mugabo is a journalist and a scholar, a Don Fang scholar, He's an expert on China, and he joins us now, I think, from Uganda. Uh, Mubarak, uh, thank you very much for joining us. 
sorry uh, to keep you waiting. Um, you are in Uganda. I won't ask you about you, Uganda, Judge. though there's much I'd like to. Uh, I want to ask you first about the BRICS. The BRICS, uh, which is a rival, you could say, to the G7, although if you add all the economies of the BRICS, they're much bigger than those present at the G7, which contains such titans as Canada and Italy, whereas the BRICS is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, and next time, probably Argentina. Uh, you, as a scholar, were looking at the BRICS, I'm sure. Uh, what did they achieve with their uh, annual convocation? Thank you, Judge. I think um, they, they could be like a technical glitch somewhere. I think you can as well repeat the last part of the question. I did not get it. Sorry. Uh, this is a very long delay in any case. Uh, I was asking you what happened at the BRICS. Well, uh, the, the 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 BRICS, as as you all you have put it quite clear, it's 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 an organized it's an association of uh, five major developing economies and emerging economies that uh, chose to come together and create an alternative of the existing international order that is majorly controlled by the West, the United States, and uh, its allies, and. Uh, this summit, uh, the 16th summit, was held uh, virtually, uh, hosted by President Xi Jinping of China. And they came up with quite a number of uh, resolutions and quite a number of uh, areas which they think they are going to pay much attention in terms of working together and making sure that this comes and also bears the true uh, fruits of the, the ideas on which it was you know, formed. And I think it is quite more representative of major developing countries, but not only developing countries, not only major emerging economies, but also developing countries. We feel like we are much more represented by the major, uh, uh, by the major emerging economies, uh, which are five South Africa, India, Russia, uh, and then Brazil, and, 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 and maybe China one time, uh, maybe Argentina and also others which are shown interest in joining. And we think that because they address, uh, they, they focus so much on areas which, think, which seem to be uh, of great importance to developing countries like Uganda and many others in that category, we feel like BRICS is one of the uh, platforms or one of the fronts that are going to be helpful to make sure that we cooperate with different countries on equal basis with mutual respect on areas of economy, areas of security, and areas of making sure that we move forward without uh, encumbrances that have been that has been actually experienced in an in an international order that has been so much dominated by the U.S. and uh, its allies. Yes, I mean, the, the G7 is a bit like watching Cliff Richard and the shadows in the Albert Hall, uh, whereas the BRICS was more Glastonbury, vastly bigger, watched by far more and a good deal uh, cooler. Uh, the uh, main work that you've been doing is, of course, uh, studying the developments in China and as an African, the relationship between Africa and China. Tell us what you've been recently studying. One, we, we have been studying uh, masters of law and international relations. And uh, mostly th that's, that's a side of what exactly uh, is happening on a broader picture. I have been, I'm, I'm an advocate of China-Africa relations. I feel uh, China 
and 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 like minds like Russia, Argentina have got a lot to share with Africa because Africa is home of a majority of developing countries and working with the developed world has had excesses on us has put on so much conditions on doing many things we can know what explore our potential actually we're, 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 i think uh, in other words we are yeah. not allowed I think we're losing you, Mubarak. It's uh, a particularly uh, bad line. We'll, we'll try and establish uh, better contact. I understand you're in a taxi. Maybe we'll call you back when you've reached your destination. Uh, that's uh, Mubarak Mugabo, journalist and scholar, uh, getting into his stride about China-Africa relations. I don't know what time it is uh, for him to be in a taxi in Uganda, but... Well, taxi journeys in Uganda, from my experience, can be hairy experiences. Uh, now, should Joe Biden step down as U.S. president? Uh, A, yes, 85%. B, no, 15%. Bad news for old Joe. Uh, on YouTube, it's yes, 87%. No, 13%. And on Telegram, it is even worse news, Joe. Yes, 93% of the people on the Telegram poll think that Joe Biden should step down. No, 7%. You can vote on my Twitter, on my YouTube channel, and on my Telegram channel. More Super Chats. Thanks to Robert P, five pounds. Beware of Johnson. He's quickly turning into a tyrant, unable to leave power. Off with him now, says Robert. And Arlen Everest says, uh, sends US dollars, $10, $10, thank you. Jason Kane, two British pounds, thanks Jason. Electrobiotics, blood electrification, magnetic pulsing, colloidal silver and EMF protection. I'm yours, Electro, uh, nine euros 99. And George, what are your thoughts on the last 12 hour documentary about World War II, including lots of unseen video footage? It's called Europe, The Last Battle, on BitChute. I didn't know about it, but I'm very much looking forward to Elvis, the biopic. As a matter of fact, I've got a show coming out uh, with a very, very talented Grammy Award winner, Malcolm Byrne, in uh, New York State, his uh, radio station at 1 a.m. US time, uh, 1 a.m. our time in the UK uh, is coming out this evening. I'll no doubt that will circulate on uh, on social media and he was telling me that Elvis is undergoing a tremendous revival in the United States and a very good friend of mine Sean O'Donnell was so impressed by the biopic last night that he's even thought about going back to see it again tonight I'm going to take my older children to see it so they can see what all the fuss was about let's go to the lines Michael in Minneapolis always a pleasure Mike to talk to you, George, although today is a darker day than most, I'll be honest. So this Supreme Court has been fully unleashed towards the end of their term with the rulings they come out with. And it's I know the, the Roe v. Wade has gotten the, the most attention and, and you know, um, sending the right to abortion back to the state is, you know, remember Roe v. Wade was decided on a right to privacy. So they're basically overturning not just the right to abortion, but also the right to privacy. Clarence Thomas came out and said he also wants to revisit overturning contraception and same-sex marriage. And on top of that, the Supreme Court struck down a New York handgun uh, limitation last week. And honestly, probably as scary as Roe v. Wade, um, West Virginia versus the Environmental Protection Agency is, is about to come down. And the word is that the Supreme Court is going to rule that, the, the, that basically federal agencies which there are all kinds of federal agencies that, you know, everything from education to commerce to whatever. But in this case, the Environmental Protection Agency are not allowed to regulate the environment is a real thing. So you look back to the Reagan years and, I, and, you know, I wasn't alive for them, but Grover Norquist, you know, I must, he said that he wants government so small he can drown it in a bathtub. And now we have a bunch of Christian nationalists on the Supreme Court, these far, far 
you know, extreme people and they are fulfilling his, you know, they're fulfilling what he wanted. Although the government's big enough to, you know, stop you from allowing to have an abortion, but they're, they're going to stop the government from doing anything else useful. And I just, George, I feel like I'm, I'm living in a dystopian reality. And I just, I'm wondering from your perspective, where does it even go? Where is this headed? Because it seems pretty dark right now. In the well, uh, I, 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 as I've said before, Michael, I have no idea uh, why you have such reverence uh, to uh, a group, a small group at that, of judges. I agree. Neither I have agree. I any idea why you have such reverence for a constitution written by a small number of white, rich, slave-owning slave men. Uh, I agree who, with that too. Who, who didn't regard even white women as, as uh, equal. They're all, this, all men are created weak, uh, equal, but they didn't mention women, and they certainly didn't intend that their own slaves uh, were uh, equal to no. them. So this uh, ancestor worship, yeah, I mean, this ancestor worship of, uh, of uh, the, the Constitution, uh, I, I simply don't understand it. It's one of the reasons why we are uh, two peoples divided by a common language. I've, yeah. uh, I've never understood it. But uh, Joe Biden is the president of the United States. And he won't do Rather anything about more it, George. up to date and relevant. He won't do anything about it. He anything. won't he make the so. court he, he bigger. He came out and said he won't do anything about it. Yeah, he came yeah. right out and said he, so, won't, he uh, won't make the board only... and, he, and he won't do what Bernie Sanders said, which was to rotate justices off the Supreme Court onto the federal court and vice versa. That was burnt after a certain amount of years. That was Bernie's idea. But Joe won't do that either. He, he claims his hands are always tied. Joe Biden can't ever do anything, no matter what. He, he can't do anything to help us, no matter how bad things get, no matter the situation. <sighs> They're it's, using it's, it's this as, uh, as, as a recruitment for votes in November and yeah. most particularly as a, fundraising, as a fundraising mechanism amongst liberals uh, across the country, no? You're absolutely right, George. That's exactly what they're doing, and it's sick because millions of people are going to suffer. Millions of people are already suffering, and it's only going to get worse and worse. I mean, there were people waiting to get abortions who were turned away. I mean, imagine you know, that, and it's just, and if they, if they overturn same-sex marriage and contraception, I mean, it's like we're living in a different century. Well, uh, what, what do you mean on contraception? They're, they're going to Clarence stop Th the Clarence, state, Clarence, Th uh, yeah, the Clarence Thomas came out and said that he wants to ban forms of contraception and he wants to look at overturning same-sex marriage. Clarence Thomas came out and said that, Justice Clarence Thomas, who remember, Joe is only on the Supreme Court. He had been credibly accused of rape by Anita Hill, but Joe Biden protected him in his confirmation hearings 30 years ago or so. And so Joe Biden helped well, Clarence Thomas I'm so get old. on the Supreme Court. I'm so old I can remember every fine hair of that uh, argument. Michael in Minneapolis, thanks very much, as always, for your erudition. Kick Clarenberg's up next after this quick break. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dictotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You 
are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, Michael and Minneapolis filling in in some more detail the incredible hypocrisy of Joe Biden and the Democrats on matters judicial and indeed on matters concerning abortion. Should the aforementioned Joe Biden step down as U.S. president? A, yes, B, no. Vote now on my Twitter account, on my YouTube channel, and on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, and uh, follow me there. Uh, to call uh, Kit uh, Clarenberg uh, an investigative journalist would be a considerable understatement, as I often say, a bit like saying, Cristiano Ronaldo is a footballer. Cristiano Ronaldo is the greatest footballer and Kit Clarenberg is not just the greatest investigative journalist on this side of the, the Atlantic Ocean these days. He's just about the only one. Uh, certainly him and his fellows at the Grey Zone, Max Blumenthal was on last week, I think, or the week before, uh, and many other Grey Zone investigative journalists have uh, appeared on the show over recent months and years. But the reason why Kit Clarenberg is particularly important and red hot right now in Britain is because of his incredible groundbreaking journalism over the unmasking of the former Trotskyite Paul Mason, a former BBC economics editor a man who play acts even until this day as a leftist turned out to be a rat, turned out to be a man who informed on his own friends, turned out to be a man secretly and through a variety of, as he would put it, cutouts, was intending to hunt down people with dissident views on the likes of the war in Syria or the war in Ukraine or attitude to NATO, attitude to empire. He was seeking to establish a nexus, a nexus of people who would witch hunt in a McCarthyite drive to have dismissed, have deplatformed, have demonetized, have be taken off the air, people like me. I was in his uh, graph, uh, I was glad to say, I'd have been offended if I wasn't, a graph which purported to show how Russia and China were manipulating politics in Britain, and indeed in the United States, but in Britain in particular, right down to the streets of the north of Britain, of the Muslim community, of the black community, of trade unions like the RMT that I spoke about earlier, how really Russia and China were pulling the strings through people like me, of all of them. It doesn't get much lower. To be unmasked in such a way, you would have thought would have left the now naked Paul Mason with nowhere to go but the library with a pearl-handed revolver and a bottle of whiskey. But not so. Mason is unembarrassable. He is impossible to shame. Let's see if we can find out more from the one and only Kit Clarenberg. Kit, thanks very much for uh, joining us. Before I turn to Paul Mason, you wouldn't expect me not to. Uh, I just wondered if you'd seen the interview uh, with the excellent chaps at Declassified that Mason couldn't quite work out whether they were Russian puppets or not. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn gave an interview with them in the week in which he made some quite startling, not surprising, uh, but quite startling and shocking uh, revelations about the role he thought that the security services had played in his downfall. If you saw it, tell us what you thought. 
Well, I mean, yes, um, I, 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 this was an absolutely extraordinary interview, although I will preface this by saying it's extremely disappointing. Jeremy seemingly hasn't found his voice until now. Yeah, this is well over two years after he stepped down as leader. This is almost two years since he was egregiously suspended from the Labour Party for the high crime of telling the truth about the non-existent anti-Semitism crisis, which he allegedly presided over. And bizarrely, he seems committed to returning to Parliament as a Labour MP, you know, being reinstated by a party that not only wronged him and his supporters, uh, but continues to do so brazenly. You know, the, the party as it stands now uh, is a bunch of, you know, a ragtag bunch of Tories and New Labourites committed to purging Labour of any and all meaning and principle in pursuit of a centre-right centre middle ground, uh, which they're never ever going to appease. I, I mean, you know, all that said, uh, Jeremy was unprecedentedly candid uh, in a way I, you know, no other former party leader I can think of in history has ever been before, I think. Uh, you know, he confirmed what many of us already knew, but added absolutely vital new detail to, to what did happen to this wide-ranging establishment plot at every level to sabotage him and his leadership and ensure that hope for millions of oppressed people within Britain you know, and indeed abroad was just comprehensively crushed. You know, this involved the military, elements of the Labour Party, the, the Israel and Gulf lobbies very prominently, and the, uh, the, the establishment media like The Guardian um, and the security intelligence services. They were all arrayed against him uh, and everything he represented and were willing to go to almost any length to ensure uh, to uh, ruin his electoral chances. Um, the, the intelligence services were briefing against him in private. They were setting up traps for him to fall into. So they invited him for a kind of routine briefing, um, MI5 and MI6, at their offices on, on the terror threat. And this was framed in the press as uh, you know, him having to be brought to heel because he was such a threat to national security. You had former, um, you know, uh, you know, both on and on, off record uh, senior intelligence um, uh, officials like Richard Dearlove saying that you know, sort of casting aspersions as to whether Jeremy Jeremy Corbyn was a you know <laughs> Czech or Soviet spy. That yes, again, that he was a threat to national security. That Britain would not be safe if he was in Downing Street. You know, or like, or this is heinous libels. Um, and he remained silent at the time. Um, you know, I see that the Observer today said that Boris Johnson's continued um, uh, tenure in Downing Street was a national disgrace on the basis of his dishonesty, immorality and corruption. We knew very well uh, who Boris Johnson was and what kind of government he would lead, uh, you know, years in advance of him getting there. So, I mean, it's a shame that <laughs> it's, 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 it's a shame that they, 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 they didn't see, see it as an incumbent to warn people you know, more and that they saw Jeremy as, as the greater evil. Um, you know, and I still, you know, I also find it you know, completely incredible, uh, uh, as Jeremy said in this interview, that he didn't do proper due diligence into that snake in the snake's clothing, Keir Starmer, and, you know, uh, identified what he, you know, who he was and what he actually represented, which is, you know, the British establishment, the security services and total prostration to the world of the US empire, as exemplified by his energetic efforts to, uh, to lobby Swedish authorities to keep the completely bogus sexual assault charges against Julian Assange open. Um, you know, for the purposes of blackening his reputation and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, the offer, offering up more reason for him to get extradited to the U.S. It is, uh, I agree with everything you said there. Uh, it is important uh, to, and th this interview did that for me, uh, to confront again uh, the sequence of events which we all lived through and and we, we felt the blows and, and so on, but a bit of perspective, uh, and then you look back on a situation where in a so-called democracy, the leader of Her Majesty's opposition, the Right Honorable Jeremy Corbyn, Privy Councillor, was told by the American Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, and the man who was plotting to kidnap Julian Assange on the streets of London, and if necessary, to kill him there. By uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, both of these foreign statesmen uh, made it clear that they would, they would uh, move any mountain, do anything, stoop to anything, to stop the British people electing Jeremy Corbyn as their Prime Minister. And then, as I myself had forgotten, a serving military officer on television saying that the armed forces would take action 
to stop Jeremy Corbyn? Uh, should he uh, look like he was going to uh, become the elected Prime Minister of Britain? I agree with you, it's in a, Inex inexplicable, inexcusable that uh, Corbyn has been so quiet for so long uh, about all of this, but at least it's now back on the, on the agenda. And that has its chilling effect, uh, doesn't it, Kit? Just like the Assange effect. Uh, if, if you think that you're going to upset the apple cart in British politics, uh, that you will be subject to what is essentially a coup and may not even escape with your life, you're much less likely to take a chance on doing that, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. I mean, and I think that, that actually, I, I mean, for the longest time, for well, for you know, two and a half years now, I have cited the you know, experience of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader as, as a very clear example of the fact that Britain isn't in a de democracy. You know, decisions are not made by the people. They are made by vested interests, by you know, powerful seen and unseen lobbies, um, of which the British public is is virtually, um, you know, you know, well, always completely uninformed and is, you know, and is never reported in the mainstream media. I mean, I think that, you know, with you know, Mick Lynch uh, now so effectively forcing working class interests back on the national agenda, um, you know, it, it, uh, uh, it, I mean, the, the declassified interview is, 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 is a very timely publication. You know, I would implore him and indeed all your viewers to read that, the, the, you know, read it in full, to know precisely what they're up against. You know, Starmer, despite his ever dwindling popularity and ever increasingly blatant irrelevance, is still a, a, committed to erasing all traces of Corbynism from Labour and its membership and its parliamentary representation. You know, he will not stop until there is no revolutionary fervour left anywhere um, in, the, in the mainstream. He cannot be allowed to succeed. But yes, I mean, I think that you know, what you know, what Lynch is demonstrating is that we, we might not always live in a democracy, but we can do. People need to collaborate. They need to unite. They need to mobilize uh, yeah, uh, and, you know, not stop until they get what they want. Um, that was one of the major failings of Corbynism was that John McDonnell was constantly in his ear saying you need to compromise, you can't annoy too many people. And then we end up with a disaster that was the second referendum, which is what really killed killed off labor you know like that that that's kind of you know, middle ground um <laughs> uh you know, you know way, way of doing things is always going to fail because you know, you have an enemy or indeed enemies who you know never bend who never compromise and will find anything they can to attack you it's the same with the manufactured anti-semitism crisis you know uh, chris williamson uh, the now former mp for for derby north uh, made a, you know, the, the completely reasonable observation that the uh, the anti-Semitism, the, the charges of, of widespread anti-Semitism in Labour were, were, were fraudulent. And in fact, actually, Labour had a consistent track record of standing up against anti-Semitism. He was told to apologise by party chiefs and you know, by the membership and in the hope that this would make everything go away. And the second and he did, oh, he's admitted to being an anti-Semite, so therefore he needs to be suspended. And this is what they do. So yes, do not compromise, do not stop marching until you get what you want. I'll, uh, I must sit down with you sometime. Uh, I became very friendly with, uh, with Harold Wilson after he left office. And uh, he told me in some detail in his rather gloomy mansion flat behind Westminster Cathedral, about how they, they bugged and burgled him uh, throughout his uh, time as Prime Minister. It's a good story. Uh, now, Kit, um, I'm so old, I remember Paul Mason when he was a raving Trotskyite who thought I was a backsliding reformist, the worst insult you could give on the left back in those days. Now we know that Paul Mason is something different. And we have you to thank uh, for that. Give us a quick summary, please, of what it is that you discovered about Paul Mason. Okay, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's an incredible transformation, isn't it? I mean, I think in your own words, George, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a butterfly back into a slug. I mean, you know, this is a, yes, a former Trotskyite, you know, a pro Corbyn, pro Syriza, anti war tub thumper who it, it now appears, it, uh, at least in his, uh, his latter years, is a, is a British intelligence asset and fifth columnist on a secret mission to destroy the anti-war, anti-imperialist left. It's not clear when he turned, or, uh, you know, there's, the, the obvious question is if he turned at all, and, you know, he wasn't, in fact, always a kind of sleeper agent um, and wrecker 
uh, behind the scenes, hiding in plain sight. Um, but he now, at least now, possesses a, a good, quote-unquote, friend in British intelligence with whom he is coordinating, and it seems this, this individual is, is directing um, his activities um, in smearing um, you know, anti-war, anti-imperial activists, academics, journalists, media outlets like Declassified UK as somehow, you know, witting or unwitting tools of Kremlin and, you know, Be you know Beijing's malign influence in Britain. Um, it's, really, it's a very, very extraordinary transformation. Um, you know, he has publicly smeared critics of the you know, established Western narratives of the Ukraine conflict as Putin puppets. He sought to have independent media outlets like the Grey Zone and independent journalists such as myself deplatformed and financially ruined through malicious underhand tactics. Yeah, and as our subsequent investigations will show, uh, it appears his attempts to enter Parliament as a Labour MP are being uh, directed, or at least yes, coordinated with British intelligence. And this, you know, if he is elected, I see that he's now running in. Uh, uh, my my birthplace of Camberwell and Peckham, um, you know, from my cold dead hands, um, uh, you know, you know, if yeah, essentially, he's been giving been given lists of talking talking points and direction in terms of you know how to campaign by a British intelligence officer. You know, he claims that the suggestion that he has any relationship with British intelligence is false and defamatory. But, you know, it's all there in black and white in leaked emails that we have acquired. Uh, and we're going to keep reporting on them. We will not stop because, you know, this is of such uh, public interest. His attitude and his approach to dealing with this, you know, very obvious scandal has been to claim that, uh, uh, well, it's all false. I'm not going to comment on it and just carry on going as normal. Um, you know, people aren't buying this, but he's just committed uh, to, this, uh, to this strategy. Extraordinary. Uh, Camberwell and Peckham, he'd have to get through me and you uh, first uh, if that were to uh, turn out. But I suspect that the members there will have the same kind of taste uh, that the members who turned him down didn't even put him on the shortlist because nobody likes a grass. Nobody likes a rat, do they? Oh, no, I mean, you know, and, and I think that, it, again, that the, the, his communications with this British intelligence officer, uh, he goes by the name of Andy Price. Um, I think that it just really sums up, uh, you know, what Jeremy Corbyn said during the 2019 general election campaign. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not me that you're, they're afraid of, it's you. You know, this is all about ensuring that Labour remains a... Uh, uh, a form of limiting revolutionary fervor, uh, you know, as a barrier to change. Um, and yeah, the, the, I mean, it, it, it's incredible to me that Mason would sign up to this. I'm not in short, I'm not, it's not entirely clear um, from, from the emails, the extent to which he is fully conscious or that may be, you know, a failure of, of in quote unquote intelligence, you know, on, on, on his part, you know, it, 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 but you know, he's feeding you know, information on conferences that he attended. He's boasting of how his efforts have quote unquote cauterized um, Stop the War and Jeremy Corbyn in, in, in Britain and how you know, no one wants to be associated with him publicly. I mean, I think that actually you know, with these enormous protests across the country now, mass industrial action uh, at which, you know, you know, Jeremy Corbyn is, is at the forefront. He's finding out how wrong uh, he was and actually how, how, you know, how, how little influence he has. Um, and again, I just think, you know, the, 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 there's, that, there's, that, there's that cliche, which is, oh, well, you know, pe this, this person wasn't sorry when, when they were getting away with it. You know, Mason was doing this for months, you know, in secret, um, and then, yes, now his approach is to just to, to just uh, try and cauterize it and say, oh, well, this is nothing. I'm going to carry on and I'm not going to comment on it. Um, he, ca he can't be allowed to get away with this. It's really, really, really shocking. I mean, we already have a Labour Party that is led by an individual. Yes, the, the aforementioned uh, snake Keir Starmer, who is you know, up to his elbows in the security intelligence services. Uh, quite clearly, they played some role in shutting down um, official investigations and criminal prosecutions of intelligence officers who were intimately embroiled in torture and extraordinary rendition. And so, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's the open question, isn't it? Like, how many more effective assets and agents are being run within the Labour Party directly by British intelligence? This is, you know, the, our reporting on, on Paul Mason represents, you know, yes, just, just one tranche of leaked emails. Quite, quite how many others are on the payroll or are being managed and, and directed is an open question. 
Kit Clarenberg will be following your work, of course, with intense interest on the grey zone. And uh, follow Kit on, uh, on Twitter. Also, he is a font of powerful and important information. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Should Joe Biden step down as US president? Yes, 86. No, 14. Yes, 88. No, 12. Yes, 93. No, 7. It's getting worse for sleepy Joe uh, Biden. After the break, we'll be talking with the one and only Garland Nixon on this Roe versus Wade and the Supreme Court and the American Constitution and so on. And we'll be talking about the rail strikes and Boris Johnson uh, with the one and only Mark Seddon. Here are the phone numbers if you want to join in. If you're in the United Kingdom, remember the calls are completely free. 08081965522. And if you are in the United States, also toll free, cost you nothing at all, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. Or email us on air at moats.tv. Mike Pepper donated ten pounds. Thank you, Mike. And he says I may go hungry for a day, but it's a small price to pay. God bless you, Mike. And uh, David Pierce donated two pounds. Kathy from Iowa donated US dollars five. Jonathan Corson donated two pounds, says midweek moats and midweek moats, bring it back. And based Tanky donated US dollars 10. And he says, or she says, our only hope here in the US is door 24. Thanks for all you do. And right behind Jimmy Dore, why should Zelensky be the only comedian in power? Now, uh, Paul Unsworth, by the way, I didn't mention him, donated five pounds. God bless you. And Remborn, a regular now, donates every week. He donated 50 British pounds. Remborn, I take my hat off to you, sir, or madam, whomsoever you are. Now, don't accuse me of not being fully behind the railway workers. I addressed the annual conference of the National Union of Railway Men, as it was then called, more than 40 years ago at their annual conference in St. Andrews in Scotland. The theme of my speech was regeneration. Then, not really a word as much in use as it later uh, became in not the most salubrious of circumstances. I talked about the natural phenomenon of how when you damage a twig, it regenerates. And I was lecturing the National Union of Railway Men on the need for the labor movement to regenerate. Forty years on, it is the Railway Workers Union that is itself regenerating faith in trade unionism in an alternative to how Britain is. I took a trip down the railway. Here's what I had to say. At first it was faintly amusing, the sights and sounds of florid faced fat cat journalists and broadcasters fulminating, vituperating about the wages some members of the Rail Maritime and Transport Union, the RMT, are earning. But by no means all members, of course. First, they tried to inflate the number to imply that every person working on the railway is earning £57,000 a year, if only. And of course, insofar as railway workers are keeping up, by and large, with the rise in the cost of living, that's because they've got a union, organized, well-led, determined, together and strong. But they quickly realized when the first opinion poll showed that half of the British public support the railway workers strike for an inflation level pay settlement and that's an important qualification you know 
because of course if you get a pay rise that is less than the level of inflation you just got yourself a pay cut anyway back to the fat cat journalists and broadcasters not a single one of britain's journalists is earning less than double the wages of the railway staffs and some of the worst offenders i'm thinking tory boy pierce for example are to my certain knowledge earning 10 times 10 times the amount of the railway workers whose greed he was denouncing hourly on social media daily in print and daily on your television set now i don't know about you but I find it impossible, actually, because I'm an empathetic person, to imagine denouncing someone who earns 10 times less than me for greed. It just doesn't compute with me. Anyway, they got stuck with the opinion poll. It stopped them in their tracks. When it turned out that despite all of their propaganda, that the public, half of the public polled, fully support the rail workers strike, they realized they had a problem. And that's when it went from faintly amusing to very dark indeed. Blood on the tracks. Here's what happened. Despite all of my political experience and despite the bitter experience of the last few years, I didn't see this one coming. The Guardian, where else, this week, reporting an unnamed high labor source, sprays the specter, I'm not making this up, that the RMT, the Rail Workers Union, might be anti-Semitic. Keir doesn't think Mick Lynch, about whom more later, the RMT leader is himself anti-Semitic, but Keir thinks he has to explain how the RMT has become a, quote, unsafe space, unquote, for its Jewish members. This one bowled me over. I, I really didn't see it coming. I knew that this so-called Labour Party was a debauched, degenerate, caricature, disfigured, distorted version of a Labour Party, but I never thought that even a Labour Party that had banned its MPs from joining the picket lines of the rail workers and told its front benchers that they'd be sacked if they turned up on a picket line, I never thought they would go that low. I never thought that they would descend into that pit of attacking workers, striking for a living wage with the smear of anti-Semitism. Now, frankly, I doubt very much whether that will cut through with the public. I doubt very much if the railway workers will even know what on earth Starmer is talking about. But it was an early sign that those who wish to see the defeat of the railway workers realized that actually the side that's going down to defeat in this dispute is them and the system that they represent. And then a so-called conservative grandee, Tobias Elwood, on national television, begged the railway workers not to be Putin's friends. Putin, he said, would be delighted at this disruption, like Putin is sitting in the Kremlin, charting the course of a railway worker strike. What is this, 1926 or 2022? Is Putin Lenin? And are we in the middle of an existential general strike, a struggle for power, as we were in 1926? This is an everyday trade union dispute with a group of workers who turn out to be even 
by the admission of their enemies, an important section of the British working class, trying to get themselves an inflation level wage increase. In other words, to stand still on where they were last year. Anti-Semites, Putin's friends, you must be very worried indeed. But on another level, they should be worried. Because if the railway workers win, that will embolden other sections of the British workforce to demand a wage increase that at least keeps them exactly where they were the previous year. It's not their fault that this week inflation in Britain reached the highest level for 40 years, 9.1% and rising. It's not their fault. It's not their economic system. They don't own it or run it. They didn't declare war on Russia and implement a whole package of self-damaging, self-harming sanctions. It was the people who own and run this country that did that. Why should the workers pay for it? Mick Lynch is so good in being interviewed on television, a number of my supporters asked if I'd been giving him lessons. Well, the truth is, I've never met him. His brilliance is entirely his own doing. But one by one, as the famous film actor Hugh Laurie pointed out on social media, he wiped every picador, taunting him, sticking their spears into him, on every single television channel and every news bulletin. Dispassionate, calm, cool, collected, Mick wiped the floor with them. So much so that these highly paid pundits and broadcasters simply didn't know how to handle them. Here was a man taking no nonsense from them. When they accused him of greed, he pointed out that there are more billionaires in Britain this year than there have ever been. That the richest people in this country are richer than they have ever been. That even the bosses on the railway that are denouncing the railway workers are earning 10, 20, 30, 50 times more than some of the workers that they are denouncing. Where's the productivity? <laughs> bonuses and recognition from them. Mick wiped the floor with them because he's an honest trade union leader. And God strengthen him. May he win for his members a great victory. I was a very good friend of the late and great railwomen's leader, Bob Crow. May he rest in peace. And how I wish he could see his members in action again. They hated Bob Crow, but he didn't care. He was a Millwall supporter, after all. We are Millwall, we don't care. I'm Bob Crow, you don't like me, I don't care. My job is not to please you. My job is to win wages and conditions for the members who elected me. Bob had a very clear attitude to money. I don't care whether the money has the Queen's face or the Queen's arse on it, he said. All I care about is how much of it is in the wage packets of the railway workers of Britain. God bless you, Bob Crow. God bless the members of the RMT. Not just because if a group of workers are so important to the economy that they can bring it to its knees simply by not coming into work, if hundreds of millions of pounds are lost by the virtue of the fact they didn't turn up for work, then that means they're underpaid. That means we're not valuing their contribution well enough. Not just because I love the railway workers and the RMT, no. But because it's time that the working class got off their knees and stood up and demanded their rights. And that's all the RMT are doing. One day, because 
Nobody ever accused me of not being an optimist. One day, I believe, that all unions will be like the RMT. The all workers will be like the railway workers. And when that day comes, the world will belong to those who make it, who build it. It will belong to the workers. 99% of the people are workers. And one day, this economy will belong to them. There's only one man that could follow that, and it is the one and only Garland Nixon in the United States. Garland, thanks uh, very much for joining us. Uh, that's uh, quite a brouhaha brewing in the United States. Good old culture war keeps everyone's mind off the economy and the war. Tell us, how's it all going? Well, the um, the Roe versus Wade decision has been uh, very interesting in that in that number one, of course, jubilation in the Republican land and Republican Party. They're happy. They've been fighting for that, and they can argue that they have delivered something to their base. What is interesting is that um, there is a muted jubilation jubilation in the uh, leadership of the Democratic Party. Uh, they were uh, very concerned with uh, the upcoming midterm elections in November. It was pretty much clear that they're going to they're facing you know destruction of biblical proportions and and they were pushing um the january 6 so-called um you know uh, attempt to overthrow the government this was going to be their plan to save themselves from political destruction and that wasn't going well obviously and uh interestingly now the when when this when the decision was first made joe biden went to the mic and the first thing he said was Roe is on the ballot. So now the Democrats see this as this is their way to save themselves in November. This is how this is the you know, this is the path to maintaining some kind of majority. I don't think it's going to happen, but it's you know, it's fairly cynical to see the Democratic Party saying, oh, we're woe is me. We're upset about this. And the other side of their face has a smile saying, hooray, we have something that we may be able to win without actually doing something for the working class. But of course, uh, President Obama and indeed President Biden could have enshrined abortion rights in law throughout the, uh, the Republic at any time, but they did not. Yes, that's the other problem that they're having, and I think that's going to grow, and that is that people who traditionally support the Democratic Party are starting to ask some um, uncomfortable questions. Uh, one of them, of course, being that in 2009, when Barack Obama took power, he had a veto-proof majority, a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate so that he could have passed anything he wanted. We have the Taft-Hartley Act that a lot of us on the left were asking him to, to address, which would um, have, have been very good for organized labor. He didn't touch that. Of course, a lot of people brought this particular issue up. He didn't touch that. In fact, Barack Obama said this was not one of his priorities. Add to this that in 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton ran with a guy, a senator named Tim Kaine, who was opposed to abortion. And at the time, the discussion was, well, the Democratic Party cannot exclude people who disagree with us on some issues. So people are starting to look at the Democratic Party and understanding that their record is that, um, as so many other things, this issue was one that was used um, to curry favor with the voters, to um, to you know expand um, their base if possible, but certainly they never really acted as though they wanted to um, to codify Roe versus Wade into law and to ensure that this wouldn't happen. And of course, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi are Roman Catholics in good standing. Uh, at least I often see them taking communion. Uh, and of course, uh, they have played footsie. Pelosi just a few weeks ago was out campaigning for a Democratic uh, candidate embroiled in a tough primary uh, who was uh, openly, like Tim Kaine, pro-life. Yes, and George, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, President Biden has stated, I personally heard him state that he was opposed to abortion, but that he didn't believe that the government should um, be in charge and should make the decision on a woman's body. And, and you know, that's all good and fine. Certainly he has a right to that. But the I think what's 
going to hurt the Democrats over the next few months is that they are now taking the position that they have always and will always be um, in favor of Roe versus Wade and that they will do anything they can to assure that the a woman's right to an abortion is um, preserved, but their history does not support that argument. And that's what they're running into now. The questions, the videos, the comments that have been made are starting to catch up with them. And uh, Biden has just said he doesn't favor uh, enlarging the membership of the court, uh, which he could do. Uh, and Sanders, for example, his idea of rotating uh, the membership of, of the Supreme Court uh, he's set his face against both of those. Well, the fact of the matter is this. The Supreme Court was created. The power, the authority to create the Supreme Court was given to Congress in the Constitution, but there was no um, specific uh, orders as to how it would be set up. So the truth of the matter is that Congress can set the Supreme Court up any way they want to. They can change it. They can make 100 people on it, or they can make one person. It doesn't really matter. It's not set forth in the Constitution. But here's the other reality. The Democrats are arguing, basically, now they're beginning to argue, you must vote for us because of Roe versus Wade. It implies that in the event that they maintain or preserve or increase their majority in November, which they have little chance of doing any of those, but it, 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 it implies that if that happens, that they will somehow act on this Roe versus Wade, codify it into law, and that'll be done. But here's the reality. If they do that, they're going to have to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate, and then they can, they can do it anytime they want if they have a majority. Well, here's the reality. They've got a majority now. So if they were going to do away with the, with the filibuster and go ahead and codify um, Roe versus Wade into law, they don't have to wait until November. They could do it now. Now, they may argue that they have a couple people who won't go along with it so they don't have the numbers. That's not going to change after November. So basically, it's, you know, cynically, it's kind of a vote for us because of Roe versus Wade as kind of a symbolic vote to show the Republicans that you don't like this, but you're not really going to get anything out of it and we're not going to change. It's more of the same. And I think that whatever fervor there is for supporting the Democrats right now in November, and there's not a lot is going to die down even more as these questions become more prominent. Let's, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what polling uh, exists, but given that nothing is ever as good or as bad as it first appears, and that's a lesson uh, I've learned in my life, uh, the decision of the Supreme Court is not to ban abortion, but to give to the individual states in the Union the right to have their own abortion laws. Now, the great majority uh, of the states will presumably continue the current uh, law. Uh, in other states that seek to, say, lower the timetable, for example, to, to the 12 weeks that I always voted for in Parliament, uh, that, that will be testable at the ballot box. Uh, you'll be able to vote for or against that in the individual states. So the issue itself will, I think, uh, calm down. But if the Democrats are mutedly celebrating, as you put it, that must mean that they think uh, that the majority of people in the United States are with them. Is there evidence for that? Uh, it seems to me the US is quite a religious country at its base. How does this issue play in Peoria. So I think that the, um, the, the, the jubilation, as I put it, at the, at the top of the, of the Democratic Party over this is not just about this particular issue. It's about a recognition that they are in a world of trouble, that in order to um, help themselves, in order to get stronger going into November, they would have to pass legislation that would be benefit to, beneficial to the working class, the working poor, and the poor. And they're not going to do that because of their um, um, their corporate um, oligarchical handlers. So they're looking for anything other than passing legislation that will help, that will benefit um, the working class to do this. And they see this as, you know, kind of like a, a drowning man in the water that's grabbing for anything. Well, this is a floating object that they think they can pull themselves up on. I don't think it's going to work. Also in that, 
our economy is getting worse and worse. Um, the the biggest conversation in the U.S. now is about you know gas prices, rent prices, things like that going up. So. Um, yes, it, there's going to be an initial splash here, but in reality, this is going to be about the economy. I do think um, it's going to be somewhat about Ukraine, which is inextricably linked to the economy because people are furious about the last $40 billion for Ukraine. And I, you hear that all the time on the streets as um, Americans uh, you know, suffer economic woes. Yeah, and let's turn to that, uh, if we may. And thanks for your time, as always, Garland. Uh, uh, he has tried, and uh, so much so it's like, uh, it's like a broken record, uh, describe all that's happening in the U.S. economy as Putin's fault, Putin's price hike, and all the rest. I predicted uh, right at the beginning, so well over 100 days ago now, uh, that uh, that would not uh, cut enough ice. Uh, in the public mind, either here or in the United States. And that in any case, even if people did blame Putin, they can't do anything about Putin. But they can do something about Boris Johnson and Joe Biden. And in the case of Joe Biden, much more quickly in, uh, in November. How is that diversion playing out? Not very well. The numbers in the polls say I've seen numbers as low as 13 percent of Americans actually buy into that. The, the, the fact of the matter is that's just preaching to the choir so that the diehard supporters of the Democratic Party would, you know, if you told them that, you know, they twisted their ankle and it was Putin's fault, they'd certainly go along with that. So these this is not a rational argument and, is, and it's accepted by people who aren't looking for a rational argument. But overall, um, I think Americans are tiring of the um, the entire Ukraine situation. I think they want um, something to happen to address their economic needs. And as we both know, things are going in the opposite direction. I predict things to get much worse, to get considerably worse for the Democratic Party going into November, um, because we will officially, I'm sure, by then be in a recession. Uh, another big part of the conversation is that the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates in what is said to be an attempt to um, lower inflation. However, as many people have argued, um, inflation, the inflation that we're experiencing now is a result of uh, supply side problems. So um, uh, uh, raising the interest rates will only affect the demand and it will push us into a, uh, into a recession all that much faster. So uh, I, the Democratic Party is in a world of trouble and people want something to happen to address their economic needs. And that's the neocons are in charge. They really don't care about domestic policy. Roll on November. Gala Nixon, who guides us along the way on all matters American. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. I should have taken a break eight minutes ago. I'm happy to take one right now, just for a minute. This is not a test. This is your emergency broadcast system. Announcing the commencement of your weekly programming sanctioned by the mother of all talk shows. Support for the working class has been authorized for use during this program. All free speech is non-restricted. Moats legends of ranking 10 have been granted straight to air status and shall not be harmed. Commencing at the siren, any and all free thinking, including socialism, will be legal for three continuous hours. Political incompetence, bigotry, and emergency medical personnel at Ward 5 will be unavailable until the program concludes. Blessed be our glorious teacher and mother of all talk shows. A University of the Airwaves Reborn. Release George Galloway. May God be with you all. That's a new one. Haven't heard that one before. Release George Galloway. I hope the day never comes where you have to uh, say that for real. More Super Chats. Thanks for donating to the Fighting Fund. Lots to read. 
Jenny BN donated five pounds, and she says Mason was allowed on TV too much to be a real lefty, and Karen Z donated US dollars five. Thanks very much, Karen. She says thanks for the continued education. And BAM XIRE donated two pounds. Congratulations on reaching the 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. Thank you for that. Uh, Jane Schoen uh, donates £2.49. Thomas donated €5. Euros. Look forward to my Sunday evenings these days. Thanks to both of you. Jason Stewart donated £4.49. Dear George, I went to see Elvis the biopic today and I was riveted as I am every week watching the mother of all talk shows. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> to be compared with Elvis is indeed a rare privilege. Uh, David Kelly uh, donates £20. Thank you for that, David. My film on another David Kelly uh, shows in the Copthorne Hotel in Newcastle tomorrow night. I shall be there. Anthony donated two US dollars and says, I love Garland. Not as much as I do, Anthony. Stephen Dixon donated two pounds. Braithwaite Bone Spurs Quacker Bush the fourth donated 10 US dollars. George, always love your comrade. Garland is tops. Thank you. I think we should make Garland our weekly hit in America. Minion Mond donated US dollars 13. Unlucky for some, but lucky for our fighting fund. Joanne Nayeri donated 10 euros. Says Putin gets the blame for everything that happens in the world. He's a useful scapegoat, but I don't think he loses any sleep over it. Neither do I, Joanne. And GM donated a whopping £50. GM, thank you very much. Unless you're General Motors, in which case, why don't you sponsor the show? Thanks, GM. Let's go to the phone lines. Karen is in New York on Roe versus Wade. Go ahead, Karen. Hello, Mr. Galloway, and thank you for having your program and your format. Um, I, I enjoy it so much. Uh, Always I, a pleasure. My comment is um, indirectly related to the Roe v. Wade decision. Um, I personally got a lot of pushback in recent weeks whenever people were complaining about the possibility of the decision that they got. I would say, why, if it's important, hasn't it been settled a long time ago? I think it's almost 50 years ago since that decision, and they just let a precedent hang and considered that decided law. But it, it wasn't, obviously. Um, the, uh, That's right. Uh, uh, and the Democrats have had uh, the supermajority to codify it and enshrine it in law and they declined to do so because as usual they wanted to run with the hare and with the hounds right so uh along those lines so i um you know i have my own personal moral prerogative but i would not want that to be a basis for someone else's decision and I do believe in our society, we need a government that's separate from religion. And to me, it seems like this should be a medical decision between a person and their physician. And it really doesn't need to go any further than that. It should not be, uh, we've never had success with trying to legislate moral issues. Um, so I- Powerful checking, point, thanks, uh, thanks. Yeah, go on. Last point. Go on. I checked into the health care problem in our country, which I didn't want, realize was a problem, because if it reverted to just a medical decision, in the United States, we do not have a constitutional right to health care. Quite so. So it was something that... That's another said, thing the founding fathers never thought of. Karen, thanks. I must press on because... Actually, the lines are red hot, as I expected they would be, and not least on this issue. Edward is in Oregon. Always a pleasure, Edward. Go on. George, I, I think it's, it's important to uh, point out that the Supreme Court uh, is not intended to make law. The Supreme Court is intended to interpret law. Law is to be made 
by our legislators. If they don't have the gumption to stand up and actually take a stand and make law, then it is not the job of the Supreme Court to make law in their stead. And that was what Roe v. Wade was, was the Supreme Court making law, and it is not their job, and it, precedent be darned. Uh, it makes no difference what precedent is. What, what does make a difference is what the law is, and the law says the Supreme Court is an interpreter of law, not a maker of law. And if you look at the map right now, they didn't make abortion illegal. And it looked like to me more than half the states, it's still legal. So someone might have to take a little drive to get an abortion, but abortion hasn't been made illegal. Well said. Thanks, Edward. I uh, made some of those points myself, but you've made them better. Uh, let's go uh, elsewhere. Well, my good wife, Gayatri, has a social media uh, update because I simply don't have the means all the time to collect all the social media that is coming in. What's rattling, Gayatri? Oh, hello. Good evening. Let me start with some responses uh, to the poll. John Mimi says, I'd actually prefer his state. The West seems to be heading into the side of a mountain at full speed under his leadership, Joe Biden. And Gurma Mangesha says, they can keep him in office if they want to fast track America's downfall. And uh, Michael Weir says, Mr. Galloway, as an American who did not vote for Mr. Biden, I find his presidency to be an unmitigated disaster, both at home and abroad. However, he hasn't committed treason. So being bad in office isn't disqualifying. We will vote him, uh, we will vote his party out of Congress this fall and then him in 2024. How are you? I suspect that's uh, true, uh, but uh, if the Democrats had any sense, uh, they wouldn't have picked him. Now that they picked him, they'd get rid of him as soon as possible because, uh, to me, uh, he is, you know, they said of Gerald Ford long before you were born that he couldn't chew gum and walk in a straight line at the same time. Uh, and, uh, you know, Joe, Joe Biden can't even chew gum. Uh, his dentures would undoubtedly uh, come out. And he can't walk in a straight line or cycle in a straight line. He can't speak in a straight line. He can't do nothing. And I just think it makes America a laughing stock in the world. Right, that's your point. Uh, have, uh, from Jed, I've got the following. Have I got this right? Ukraine wanted to join NATO so it wouldn't get invaded by Russia. And Russia invaded Ukraine because Ukraine wanted to join NATO. And NATO is supposedly an organization to prevent wars. Could anything be more stupid? Yes, one thing. Blockading Kaliningrad, uh, the part of Russia that is separated by the territory, for now, of Lithuania. If anybody out there thinks uh, that, two things, if anybody out there thinks that the big Russian bear is going to allow this gnat uh, of Lithuania to starve a part of Russia called Kaliningrad, with which it has a treaty with Lithuania and with the European Union, uh, to preclude exactly the siege that Lithuania has now declared on that territory. If anyone thinks Russia is going to put up with that, then they're a fool. And uh, secondly, if anybody thinks that the mothers and fathers of the soldiers in America, in Britain, in Germany, in France, are going to sacrifice their sons and daughters for Lithuania, they too have got another thing coming. One more, Gadri, and then I One need to One more go. Uh, in response to the interview with Kit Klanberg. Jean says, I believe Paul Mason uh, remains very much committed to Trotskyite. And P.S. Messi is the greatest footballer. Okay, two very controversial points uh, there uh, to end on. Thanks uh, very much for that very uh, brief uh, social media roundup. It's just that we're under such pressure tonight. Thanks, Gayatri. Uh, John is in Michigan on the U.S. president. Go ahead, John. Well, George, I'm going to make history on your show tonight. I uh, announced that I'm going to be president and start distributing my, um, my web um, network 
uh, this week. And basically, I don't have to tell you what the problems are because nobody could explain them better than you. And I just decided about four months ago that is enough is enough. I'm a working class man. I've raised my children. They're both healthy, happy. I know what families need. Nobody was coming to make a difference. I'm, I decided I needed to run for president because there is nobody else that's going to do it. And so, therefore, um, I'm announcing it on a mother of all talk shows because I couldn't think of a better place to do it. Go ahead, uh, John. Uh, what, what, what platform, what party, how can people follow you? Okay, so I'm running as an independent. Um, and the, and so it, it isn't so much just about me. I, I stand with 80% of the American people is, uh, in terms of what they want, health care for all, a living wage, child care, child tax credits, and the list goes on. The polls show what the, the issues are. So 80% of all Americans, and especially progressives, already agree with my platform. But this isn't just about me becoming a president, but I'm doing that because if I can succeed to become president as an independent, I'm going to take my money like Bernie Sanders did, whatever's contributed, and instead of putting it into the coffers of the DNC to be distributed to corporate corrupted and oligarchy corrupted politicians, it's going to go toward building an independent movement. Well, I think that's admirable. How can people follow you? Are you on social media, John? Yes, let me give you my website. It's J O N, my first name's John, J O N S T A S E F O R, President 2024.com. Joe Stasi. Is Stasi your family name? My family name is Stasevich, but it was such a long name that when I developed the website, they figured Stacy. So J O N S T A S E. And then for president 2024.com. And actually, George. Excellent, John. If you, yeah. If you could really help me, um, at some point in time, I'd like to be interviewed to get into the detail. Obviously, in a short call, I can't explain my platform. Yeah. But you can see yeah, it on sure. my. Yeah, sure. We'll definitely, we'll definitely do that. We'll definitely do that. But my heart belongs to Jimmy Dore, uh, John. Uh, if he runs Jimmy Dore 24 for me. But I think it's a very worthwhile thing that you do, and I'm glad that you did it here. Thanks very much. There's his uh, John Spee, J-O-N-S-P-E-A-S-E for 2024.com. There you are. You don't often get a campaign launch like that. Let me take a 60-second break, then I'm back with my good friend, Mark Seddon. Talk TV, it was years in the making. It hired, I've no doubt, at a salary in the millions, Piers Morgan as its front man. <laughs> it has completely flopped, like all of the sofa politics television in Britain. Far too many of them singing exactly the same song, interviewing exactly the same people taking exactly the same line on every matter from domestic to international. The reason that our numbers are exponentially larger than a multi-million pound operation run out of Rupert Murdoch Towers. We are different, but we are free to speak our minds. Nobody tells us what to think or what to say. That goes for me, it goes for my far more interesting guests. Amongst English-speaking people around the world, this show is completely unique. But it's an endangered species. Some people have been incredibly kind and generous, giving far more than we asked for. So if you are, and you know who you are, Amongst those who've given really generously, then please take a holiday, don't keep giving. Because I'm after that big audience and I'm asking you only for one dollar. 
Is this show not worth one dollar? You don't have to buy a license fee and get sent to jail if you don't to watch the mother of all talk shows. I'm asking for one dollar or one pound if you are in Britain or one euro if you are in Ireland or elsewhere in the European Union. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge where there are no tuition fees. Well, I'm afraid uh, the shades are closing on the first poll and on Joe Biden. Should Joe Biden step down as U.S. president? Yes, 87, no, 31. That can't be right. <laughs> that adds up to a lot more than 100%. Uh, uh, so it's 87 and 13, not 31. And on YouTube, uh, 88 and 12. And on Telegram, 92 and 6. Thanks uh, very much if you voted on that. Now the second poll's coming up uh, shortly. I have no idea at all what it is, but I'll announce it to you when it comes in. Super Chats uh, coming in brilliantly. Philosophical Poet donated five pounds. Thank you, dear sir or madam. Otto Calvo uh, donated Norwegian crowns 50. Thank you very much indeed for that. And Andrew H donated 17 pounds 99 and says, could you give a shout out to all ASLEF members and solidarity with all striking workers, please, George? Indeed, Andrew, I have a long association, not just with the RMT, NUR, but also the Associated Society of Locomotive Engineers and Firemen that are otherwise known as ASLEF. In fact, I've got a centenary plate of theirs on my wall in my house that I was uh, presented by the late and great General Secretary Ray Buckton. And uh, of course, the, my own union, Unite, and its members in British Airways are also involved in industrial action now. Uh, health workers and teachers and many other sectors will all be greatly encouraged by the sense that this is not a strike, it's an uprising. There's an uprising going on in Britain. And heaven knows it's long overdue. It's a democratic uprising of people peacefully withdrawing their labor and showing their support for others that are doing so. And that's what can change the world. Don't you understand? That's what can change the world. And Kenneth Pola donated five US dollars and says, could Putin exchange UK prisoners of war for Julian Assange? He could, but he won't. And I don't think that the British would either. Now, Mark Seddon and I go back to the aforementioned 1970s. Uh, it doesn't look like it in my case, and it certainly doesn't look like it in his. He has discovered the secret of everlasting youth. He's been a Labour candidate, been the editor of the left-wing magazine Tribune. He has been a Labour grandee on the National Executive Committee. He's been a speechwriter for the Secretary General of the United Nations in New York. He's been a lecturer in journalism at some of the best universities in the world. And he still finds time for us on the mother of all talk shows. Mark Seddon, thanks uh, very much for joining us. Um, let me test you on one thing uh, first. Even by their own miserable standards, have the Blairites made a mistake in setting their face so firmly against the railway workers? Isn't the public opinion polling, isn't the number of Labour members turning up on these picket lines, including Labour members of Parliament, including front benchers, now growing so large that this must be classed as another Blair blunder? Well, uh, George, I mean, you'll be glad to hear that I was uh, down at the picket line at the Bletchley Depot uh, yesterday and uh, the, the strike, the first strike day. Um, I was actually, oh, oddly enough, I wore this jacket because I had this badge here. You're talking about, this is the, you probably can't see it, National Union of Railway. It was given to me by Jimmy Knapp. You'll remember him, uh, the leader of the National Union of Railway. Yes, I spoke about him earlier. It's very important to remember Did him. You? I spoke about him earlier. He was the man. first real leader. 
Yeah, he, he actually mobilized public opinion just like Mick Lynch is doing now. He did. He did. And, and, and to your question, yes, of, of course. I mean, I, I, I simply have to pinch myself. I've, I've watched today David Lammy, who is apparently the shadow foreign secretary, saying now is not the time to grandstand and stand on picket lines. And immediately, of course, there's been a great plethora of pictures showing him doing just that uh, just a few months ago. No, the thing is, it's, it's insulting. Yeah. It's laughable, of course. It's deeply insulting, um, but kind of power for the course from, frankly, I, I, a Labour leader who uh, really doesn't know what the word Labour seems to stand for. So, yes, I mean, they're hugely out of touch with public opinion, I think. They're certainly out of touch with the trade unions. I mean, uh, Sharon Graham, the General Secretary of the United Union, your union has been very critical today of the Labour Party. The Rail Maritime Transport Union, the old NUR, helped form the, the Labour Party. It's no longer affiliated to it, of course. It's, uh, it's just astonishing that we've got into this situation. I don't think, by the way, the Tottenham Labour Party and the uh, trade unions have all condemned David Lammy Nobody's really listening to Keir Starmer on this. Uh, I think we, just as we'll probably see a change of leadership in the Conservative Party, we're going to see it in the Labour Party as well. We'll come to the Conservatives. Just one more point on Labour. Uh, Keir Starmer was surprisingly pleased with the Wakefield result, considering that the Labour vote in Wakefield last Thursday was the lowest vote Labour have ever recorded in that constituency since 1931, the Ramsay MacDonald betrayal election. Yes, I mean, what we saw is the you know, Conservative voters simply staying at home. And uh, as you say, fewer Labour voters actually turning out in Wakefield than in, in previous elections. Look, uh, you know, everybody has been saying this. It's absolutely true, of course. You know, with a hugely unpopular Conservative government, uh, a, a Labour Party with a half-decent programme and a half-decent leader would, as they say, be 20% ahead or more. And frankly, it's feeble. <laughs> exactly. uh, and, you know, and Keir Starbuck can say all he likes, but, you know, people, most of his MPs know that, frankly, he's not long for this world politically. He's a dud. Uh, they made a mistake. Um, and so, uh, yes, it, it's, it's not good enough and he'll have to go, I suppose. Now let's turn to the uh, Conservatives. A week's a long time uh, in politics, as our old friend Harold Wilson famously said. Uh, and so it's turned out. Uh, Boris Johnson looked like he was home free, at least for a 12 month, when he uh, managed to win a vote of confidence, or rather survive a vote of no confidence, more accurately. Uh, but he doesn't look uh, all that secure now, does he? No, he's, he's beginning to look a bit like a sort of a, a Commonwealth leader who goes off on a foreign visit and then finds the troops have stormed the radio station in his <laughs> absence. And of course, he's been spending quite a bit of time with uh, President Kogami of Rwanda, who has been in power for a very, very, very long time. And now Boris Johnson is telling us that he intends to do the same. Clearly, his backbenches have got a different, a different idea about all of that. He's lost the confidence of 140 of them. Each day brings another a ludicrous scandal, the latest being we're told that uh, he tried to get uh, a business friend of uh, his to front up £150,000 for a treehouse. This is a Prime Minister lecturing, uh, lecturing rail workers uh, about uh, a 7% pay rise, which is even lower than inflation. The thing is absurd. People, look, even Tories have seen through Boris Johnson. I was talking to uh, a few Conservatives last night at this party, I came across some, and they said to me that they all thought that they were embarrassed by him. I mean, most decent people are embarrassed by him, even his supporters. Uh, everybody seems to know that, apart from the king who has no clothes anymore, Boris. Those who seek to live in glass tree houses at other people's expense uh, should be careful of throwing stones. That's absolutely correct. Perhaps he'll seek political asylum in Rwanda. Uh, he has uh, the look of a Commonwealth leader uh, about him that is, uh, that is just waiting to be deposed. Let's hope uh, the troops don't overrun this particular broadcasting studio. But 
the rules are that he can't be challenged again, but you and I both know that in politics, uh, rules are there to be broken. Yes. And, and in the case of the Conservative Party, as we know, which is a very, very brutal party when it has to be, the brutality comes in spades. And then once they've, once they've sorted it all out, it all goes back to normality again. And I have to say, in all my experience with the Labour Party, the sort of the nastiness continues for a very long time, but, but at a much lower level. But the, so the Conservative Party, the, the, as they said, the men in grey suits, it'll be the men and women in grey suits who will decide that really he's his time is up. And don't forget that a former British Conservative leader, Michael Howard, said as much the other day. So they're all plotting against him. And I'm sure that many of the MPs, we're now being told, where, by, by the way, this could be exaggerated, it could be spinned by the Labour Party, but some of these Tories in these northern seats are thinking about defecting. I think that a lot of the Tory MPs are looking at their constituencies now, seeing the voters are staying at home, are worried whether they're in the South or the North. Uh, and of course, the Conservative Party is, is supposedly an election winning machine, been 500 years of it, uh, 500 years too long in my view, but there you go. And the thing is that they'll work out that he is an election loser and I'm sure they'll change the rules and get him out. Yeah, uh, not just Michael Howard. William Hague uh, also has withdrawn his support uh, for the Prime Minister. He's looking increasingly beleaguered. And as again, we both know, uh, when, uh, when that starts to happen, uh, then the people in your own cabinet begin to uh, vie for power. Who would you suggest your uh, uh, supreme uh, analyst with huge experience, who would you suggest we keep our eye on? Well, I think we need to keep an eye on all of them because they're all absolute shockers. But I really couldn't guess. I mean, I could, I could tell you something about the Labour Party, I suppose, but I can't tell you very much about who uh, has got a big chance within the, uh, within the Conservative Party. They'll probably go for somebody who, uh, I don't know, I mean, Liz Truss seems to be quite popular amongst some of them. There's Christopher Tugendhat, who's, a, a I think, he's chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, of course, there's Jeremy Hunt, a former health secretary, uh, who I've, I've come across some uh, Tories who are talking about him. But there's, again, there's no enthusiasm for any of these people. But there again, we remember, you remember when Margaret Thatcher was uh, toppled, people said, well, who on earth could possibly follow her? And it was a very grey, dull man called John Major. But he did go on to win the next election for them. And the Tories will probably be hoping that Keir Starmer stays uh, as leader of the Labour Party, they find a new Tory leader over the next few months in time for an election, which they can now pick at their own choosing because, you know, they have any time um, between now and their five years being up to do it. So uh, I, I would have thought they'll, they'll be as pragmatic as ever they are and they'll find somebody from their ranks who they think can beat Keir Starmer or whoever Labour decides to try and get instead of him. Well, given that we live in a country where virtually nobody in the country knows the name of the leader of the Liberal Democrats and they are consistently polling at 10% and winning by-elections as they won the Tiverton, perhaps the leader doesn't matter as much as long as he is not a negative, as long as he's not dragging the party back. Possibly. I, I suspect a lot of people don't switch on to any of this until it comes to an election and they have the uh, you know, d debates between leaders. I mean, you'll remember, I mean, nobody had heard of this guy called Nick Clegg. Um, in fact, <laughs> most people have already forgotten about him. Of course, he's become a corporate shrill, as we know. But Clegg, there was something briefly called Clegg mania. Uh, he appeared on the television in the debates. <laughs> And he seemed to beat Gordon Brown. And he seemed to beat the Tory leader, and 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 suddenly everybody thought Clegg was the you know the best thing since, since uh, you know since uh, toast, um, which he then became. So look, I think they will find they will find somebody, um, and I, I yes, I, it, we don't live in it. We don't have a presidential system, but when it comes to general elections, a lot does seem to hang around the leader. But also, what the, what the what are the policies? And of course, the the problem for the Labour Party at the moment is that there don't seem to be many policies. Keir Starmer won his election, essentially saying, "Well, these policies that Corbyn had were actually quite popular. I'll keep those." And he spent the past two years shredding them all. 
So we're now in a situation where the Labour Party doesn't really have any policies and people don't know where it stands. And that's, that is Starmer's problem. So whoever becomes the next leader of the Labour Party, who I suppose it could be someone like Andy Burnham, who's already setting out his stall, um, is going to present a whole set of policies and you know, will hopefully be quite a well-known and liked figure. You'll have to get into Parliament first. Mark Seddon, as always, thanks very much indeed for your wisdom and sagacity. Uh, here's the second poll. Do you support the railway workers on strike in the UK? A, yes, B, no. You can vote on my Twitter, on my YouTube channel and on my Telegram. It's nine o'clock. It's time for a very short break from me. There is no trick other than hard work, creativity, care, and recognizing that duty is more important than love. The booming voice of Robert Maxwell, an arrogant man who used his publishing empire to gain him power and influence. But in this shocking account, never told before in this way, George Galloway recalls his first encounter with Maxwell. It looked like a, a grizzly bear uh, advancing towards me and punches me with these giant fists like sides of ham right in the solar plexus so hard that I literally bent double. Then after George exposed Maxwell as a crook in Parliament it was war. Every one of his papers the Daily Mirror then following the Sunday Mirror the Sunday People the Daily Record, then a few days later, the Sunday Mail in Scotland. Even the European, which he then owned. All over Galloway. Scottish Daily News journalist Ron Mackay was there. Every night, presumably when he had a drink in him, he would boom over the tannoy about the, 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 the cretins, the fools. But the majority of the workforce believed that he would take it over and their jobs would be secure. But of course he didn't. He just disappeared. And then... The millionaire newspaper publisher Robert Maxwell is dead. What really happened? Did Robert Maxwell jump or was he pushed? It could be that he went out to, as he did, miturate over the side of the boat. I'm with Ghislaine Maxwell in that I lean towards the murder. This is Maxwell, the monster. You said, what is my secret? I will let you and your viewers know what it is. I'm not attached to property. Consequently, losing or gaining it means nothing to me. That's actually been one of the most popular things I've ever done, that little mini documentary on uh, Robert Maxwell, my part in his uh, downfall. Uh, we need to do more of those, I think, uh, perhaps on how I unmasked the fake shake. You remember the fake shake? Or maybe you've never heard of him, in which case we must introduce him to a new generation. I unmasked him also. And you can see it on my YouTube channel if you want a preview. But uh, we'll look uh, deeper at one or two issues that I've been uh, involved in uh, with my good friend, our editor, uh, Ron Mackay. Uh, now, uh, once upon a time, Maria Farmer was uh, uh, an artist whose trajectory was headed towards greatness. She was... Uh, really beginning to attract the attention of some of the biggest and most important figures in the art world in New York. Fatally, almost, as it turned out, including Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Ghislaine Maxwell, having been found guilty on the most serious charges of trafficking children underage for sexual purposes, although we never yet learned to whom she was trafficking them and who the clients were uh, that uh, Epstein and Maxwell were procuring these 
young girls, sometimes children, for. Uh, perhaps one day, now that we can know the names and even addresses of those who donated to the Freedom Convoy in Canada, thanks to the New York Times, maybe they'll publish just a few of the names of the people on the Lolita Express, the people who regularly, repeatedly visited Epstein's Island where he sexually abused girls, women and children. And maybe one day we'll get to know who really was at the core of his little black book. In fact, if I were Ghislaine Maxwell, that's what I'd be trading right now in exchange for a more lenient sentence. Unless she knows something that we don't, that there is no need to trade because the rich and powerful people for whom Epstein and Maxwell were working have already paid and are looking forward to a prison sentence that will be less than onerous. We'll see. I misjudged the court before. I didn't think she'd be found guilty. She was. I don't think she'll be in prison for 30 years, but she might be. And if she is, she deserves every single one of them. Just while we get Maria Farmer on the line, let me uh, tell you uh, that this uh, book of mine, my latest uh, novel, is going like hot cakes, actually, because it's being sold in a bundle uh, of two, Queensway and Black Lake. You can get both of them together for just £8.99 plus postage. And uh, I know they're going like hot cakes because they're being stuffed into envelopes in my living room. Uh, that's for those who buy them from the shop, georgegalloway.shop, because I'm having to dedicate and sign them, and my whole family has become a cottage industry uh, in that. So uh, do, do get the book. Do come and see me in Newcastle tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in the Copthorne Hotel. Uh, you can uh, get the tickets from uh, the... Uh, the Ticket World, does that say? Ticketsource.co.uk forward slash Killing Kelly. Uh, I give an introductory uh, comments, then I show the film, and then I take as many questions as you have. Newcastle is a wonderful city with wonderful people. There are still tickets uh, available, so you can get them from Ticket Source. There's the uh, banner on the screen. Now, phone numbers, if you've got a point of view on Roe versus Wade, on Ghislaine Maxwell, on Boris Johnson, on Joe Biden, on Ukraine, whatever, call me if you're in the United Kingdom. It's free, 0808196552. If you're in the US or Canada, equally free, plus one, 844-944-3344. And you can email the show anytime at all at onair at moats.tv. I don't get time to read every comment out, but I promise you, I read every comment. Indeed, after the show, when I'm still on, as it were, I enjoy very much going through the comments that people uh, send in. Uh, I gave Maria Farmer the big build-up. I won't do so again, except to say I have been so impressed by her courage, and clarity from the beginning, the first victim perhaps, and the first person to report to the FBI, uh, the pernicious pair, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. And I'm glad to say Maria joins us again now in the week when Ghislaine Maxwell will be sentenced. Uh, Maria, thank you for joining us. Uh, tell you. us what you think should happen to Ghislaine Maxwell this week? Um, well, I would really like to see her spend the rest of her life in prison. <laughs> and the, But I also would like to see um, not only Ghislaine spend the rest of her life in prison, I'd like to see her stay alive. And, and I have a concern um, because uh, the, the Southern District of New York, who's sort of in charge of all of this, they, they are in charge. <laughs> 
Um, they've known about Guilan and her antics since 1996 because the FBI gave them all the information. That's how it works. So um, people sometimes don't understand why I'm so upset with the Southern District. And it's because they then feigned to have never heard of Jeffrey Epstein or Ghislaine Maxwell until Julie Brown, who is a, a writer and um, a journalist, right, for the Miami Herald. And basically, um, I, I just think I would like to see her stay alive and spend the rest of her days in prison. Well, I have a beautiful view and Virginia has a beautiful view and the rest of us do. Yes, that's what I would like. Well, uh, uh, you know, she might, to her very great surprise, uh, commit suicide. Uh, indeed, uh, this very night, she's on a, a suicide watch. Uh, right. Because, you know, the Southern District of New York, let's face it, is Clinton territory. Yes. Uh, and uh, the Clinton uh, crime family have very mm -hmm. great influence uh, there. And they have uh, a vested interest in Ghislaine Maxwell not trading names for a reduction in her sentence, don't they? They do. They have a great interest in it. And, you know, you had mentioned this before. Um, not one of the men who assaulted these children has been arrested. Not one of the people that worked beside Guilan to harm children and young women and vulnerable people. Not one has been arrested. And so that's why um, I've remained vocal. That's why new survivors, not new survivors, but survivors who didn't want to have to come out, like George Tonks, that's why um, he's come forward. Because the main person behind all of this is Leslie Wexner. And Leslie Wexner, has, he's gotten off scot-free, and we don't understand it. So he must have so much power, uh, either through the CIA or the Southern District. We just don't know what position he holds. But he's in the middle of everything, and he owns Southern Air Transport. I mean, he owns the CIA airlines, right? And, you know, my lawyers had talked to me about that ages ago. And, and I just think that uh, Brad Edwards in his book, uh, says that he believes that Epstein um, was CIA. And it if you remember that picture of Guilan where she was reading a book, uh, it was the only picture that came out when they were looking for her, you know? Um, they knew exactly where she was. And I know that because the FBI told me they always know where everyone is at all times, <laughs> internationally as well. They did tell me that. That's what Nesbitt Kirk had all said. So she kind of giggled when I asked how they found me in the woods off grid. And, um, but what's interesting is uh, basically, he lands trying to, I think, pull something. You know, they had my sister come, uh, the victims who, who testified all showed up, at, or I believe are all there right now to read their statements. And they're going to have um, Ghislaine not show up, and, and they're not going to be allowed to read any statements. So it's like we just never get justice. That's what it feels like. <laughs> so uh, Ghislaine Maxwell's legal team, they tried to stop uh, these victim statements from being uh, read. Is that right. correct? I was, I was going to ask you if I could read mine. Yes, you are more than welcome, please. Oh, thank you. Oh, you know what? I can't because it's on my phone. <laughs> so I can't actually read it. I'm sorry. But basically, well, I just... Uh, I, where can, I told... where, where, where can uh, people read it? Have you put it on your social media? Okay, so um, that's interesting. I had to go off of social media. This is something that people should know about. Um, we survivors are being really poorly treated on social media. So most of us aren't on there. I had to go off because of a, a couple people that claim they're journalists, but they're not actually journalists because they're tormenting survivors with lymphoma. They've specifically singled out the two of us who survived Wexner and are fighting lymphoma. And so I just kind of wonder what's going on with that. But anyway, I can't use any um, social media because, because of these people, because they have all these fake accounts and, um, you know, fake followers that they have tormenting us. And so we just can't even use it to the point where they're trying to assist Ghislaine in getting exonerated. These trolls that are pretending, and that's the thing, please don't buy any books written about Jeffrey Epstein, I wanna tell your audience, unless they're written by 
one of the lawyers or one of the survivors because every one of our trolls right now has a book on Jeffrey Epstein and there's a new one coming out. And the other thing is there was a lot of lies coming out about Leslie Wexner, in my opinion, um, coming out in the Hulu documentary. And you should boycott that because that was not a good experience. Um, I should not have participated. I was manipulated, in my opinion. <laughs> so anyway, well, the point uh, is, of it's, course, it's, it's uh, been a rough ride for the survivors. It's not like what people think. Like, um, basically virginia deserves the world because she's been through it i mean nobody understands what she's been through this is the strongest woman alive and she's a fighter and she's a beautiful soul and even though she's been through all those horrible things she's kind she's very kind and you know so like the trolls who are currently writing a book and who are going to publish their book during i think when the hulu documentary comes out i'm assuming um they don't even have an ounce of class. And that's the one thing that at least Julie Brown and Vicki Ward had one ounce, not more, but they have one ounce. And, but they have tormented, like Vicki Ward has tormented me for almost 26 years, 20, over 24 years now. And she recently sent a threat letter to my lawyers. I mean, I take it as a threat. It's a legal letter telling me to shut up. I never discuss her. So then I'm going to discuss her because she's culpable for what happened because she never wrote about it. And so all those girls ended up suffering. And so the other thing is Julie Brown takes credit for the whole case, but Julie Brown had nothing to do with this case. I went to the FBI in 1996. I hid because I had to go to the FBI and hide from the Clintons, right? Who the sitting president and the Trumps and all of them. I had to hide from them. And um, so people want to change history, right? They're really trying. They're trying to cast aspergences on all the survivors. They're investigating me. I mean, I had my graduate school investigate me. Why didn't they do that 30 years ago? Why are they doing it now? Why are all these people defaming me? And you have to wonder why they're supporting Gilan and who's paying them. That's what I always wonder. Because I found out through this thing, everything ends up to be about money. And Gilan Maxwell is... Uh, <laughs> is the most dangerous woman I've ever met. And these these trolls are trying to have her exonerated. It's just, it's mind boggling. I don't understand it. So I believe that she will spend the rest of her life in prison if she gets a life, right? If they actually allow her to stay alive. Well, look, Maria, uh, if you send us uh, your victim statement, we'll find a way to showcase it either on our website or our Twitter handle or on screen if we get it in time. Oh, that's I wonderful. To make the I'll send you that, both uh, mine and my sister's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll be, we'll, we'll be, yeah, we'll be uh, happy to do that. Uh, the only you. two people that were uh, ever charged in this regard were Epstein and Maxwell, and the only convicted one is Maxwell. Uh, that's right. Wexner uh, is not facing charges. He's not here to answer the points that you made about him uh, and of course we make ourselves available if he wants yes. to comment uh, that would be if he wonderful. wants to answer the points that you've made uh, about him so please mr wexner if you feel you've been wronged uh, yes. by what maria farmer has said by all means uh, enter the lists and we'll give you all the time you want um, yes. the offenses against you as I understand it, took place at Leslie Wexner's ranch. Is that right? That's right. It was on his New Albany estate in New Albany, Ohio. And I was watched on uh, cameras by his wife and his family or whomever in their home, whoever felt like watching me uh, 24 hours a day under video surveillance. I was told by Gilan and Jeffrey that the pinhole cameras were ubiquitous in the home. If I needed to, if I went to the restroom, Gilan would call me and tell me to get out of the loo because um, I actually needed, she needed to speak to me at that moment because she was watching me from New York. And I developed um, a severe, se very severe health condition from the trauma uh, of being at that estate. And I know it happened then because number one, some amazing doctors told me that it had been 23 years. And at that point, of, that the brain tumor had grown. And at that point I was like, you know, I was a health nut, by the way. I've always been really careful with my gut and what I take into my body. And I was an athlete. So to suddenly be very, very sick at that, I got sick at that estate. Um, when I left, my father was shocked because I couldn't get off of the sofa. 
for literally days on end, even to shower. So I got hit with this phenomenal fatigue at Leslie Wexner's house. And I was, um, my life was threatened by his right-hand man, Randy Bowie. And so, yeah, I would love it if he would come on and explain himself because he's been into this business of harming children since at least the 80s, we know. Um, we've been able to track it to at least the 80s. So, um, you know, through his survivors. And, and, and I'm not the only well, survivor. Well, as I say, uh, he's, uh, Tom, yeah, he, he, he's he also has a lymphoma. Yeah, uh, as weird, I say, you know? uh, he's not so here we're, to we're really trying answer. To, um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Maria, Maria, not, he, not he's, he's not, uh, Maria, he's not here to answer these things. Uh, and so I have to make that point that uh, he's not charged with any crime. He is the apparently respectable head of Victoria's Secret, a worldwide business. Uh, he's a very rich and powerful man. I don't know if he's litigious. Maybe he doesn't want to get into litigation, but I have to make Oh, he's extremely point, litigious. Uh, that he's um, not here. So for my first interview, yeah, all I had right. an interview well, with CBS. Uh, uh, all, the more, uh, all the more reason why I need to stop you. If he's extremely okay, litigious, you've made serious allegations against him. Yes. All I can do now uh, is reiterate that Leslie Wexner is welcome on the show or to send a statement to the show uh, answering the very serious allegations that you have made against them. Maria Farmer, thanks uh, for joining Thank us as so always. Maybe come it. back and tell us once we know uh, the result in the court, we'll talk again. Uh, lots and lots of calls tonight on Roe versus Wade. Here are only some of them. Anthony in Westgate-on-Sea in Kent. Go ahead, Anthony. Hello. Um, I was very pleased to see that the Americans have overturned Roe v. Wade because it was really uh, an extraordinarily bad law imposed on an entire nation by nine Supreme Court justices. We're hearing about you know, how outrageous it is the Supreme Court has overturned it. It was imposed by the Supreme Court you know, against the vast majority of states which which were um, against abortion. You know, and these were judiciaries that were democratically elected. Um, so I think it's it's been a very important ruling to, to throw it back to those states. But also, I mean, I'm rather shocked by the, the levels of disinformation uh, still being spread. So the observer today, I noticed said that... Um, you know, there'll be a 20% rise in maternal mortality because of some of these uh, changes in the laws. Now, that's, there's no evidence for that at all. I mean, countries like Poland, uh, Chile, uh, have, have strong restrictions on abortion, very strong laws against it. And they have some of the best maternal mortality in the world. So I think there needs to be a lot more honesty in this debate. Um, but on the second yeah, well, you don't get much honesty in... Uh, uh, yeah, quickly, Anthony. Well, I just think politically, abortion has been a, a, a topic that has basically been used to suppress left who have quite socially conservative views and alienate them. And the Democratic Party has really become the party of abortion much more than what it was a long time ago. Uh, something that actually defended, you know, working class interests. So I think it's it's important in that respect as well. Anthony, it's a, it's a poor line, but a great call. Thanks for making it. Brian is in Canada. Go ahead, Brian. What do you want to say? Well, George, I just got to read out what I said in an email, uh, just to, for clarity on my own part, because, you know, it's all a little nervous talking to a, a man like yourself, so eloquent. Anyway, so I said, George, you Thank said you, that sir. the world battles or a U.S. domestic issue, then off you go and conflate several other issues from Ukraine to COVID to the hypocrisies of Biden and Pelosi. I loathe them both. But because of your personal position on abortion, you've moved beyond both the consequences of the Supreme Court decision for the poorest women, and in fact inadvertently placed yourself in league with the most reactionary Republican state governments, with whom I presume you would differ on every That's other McCarthyism. issue. That's McCarthyism. Brian, 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 that is yes, simple is McCarthyism. That is, that is a McCarthyite smear, guilt by no, association. I have, I have my views. 
I have my views on abortion. I don't seek to impose them on anyone else. And you have no right to place me in league with reactionary Republican governors. This is a sleight of hand, of sophistry. Stop it and go on and make your point. I said inadvertently, so let me continue. If you want to at least educate yourself generally, I would study the position of most of these Republican states as they roll this thing out, and they are draconian as can be. I heard you earlier say you, you mentioned you voted at some point for 12 weeks for women, which I support, and if you support that, then I, I, I'm saying this is inadvertent on your part because you don't know how bad these states are. All right, thanks for that. Uh, Erobos in New York on the same subject. Go ahead, Erobos. Uh, greetings and salutations, Mr. Galloway. It's yourself, E. Very yes. nice to hear from you with your Sunday name. Go ahead, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, and as always, I, I, can't, I can't proceed without wishing you, your family, and your loved ones great and salubrious help now and in the future. Thank you, bro. Um, what, what I'd like Thank to you, say, bro. yes, uh, what I'd like to say is this is the moment of monsters and of heroes and heroines. We, you know, to the point that um, the earlier caller uh, made, John, it is heartening for me to see individuals, whether they be Jimmy Dore, whether they be him, that people understanding that we live in a country of 100 million activists, but nobody wants to take power, right? And that's a core failing of uh, the, the, the psyche of the American people. A hundred years ago, we had a communist party, we had a socialist party, we had a trade unions party, and they worked together and told Roosevelt, if you want to keep capitalism, you're going to have to take care of the people, right? We can't have this situation of a perpetual gilded age, you know, and um, that we're, we're circling back around to that point. So I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer with the People's Party, which means I'm in full support of Jimmy Dore uh, becoming president. However, if any other individual wants to select themselves, as long as they're non-corporate, you know, non-aligned with the Democrats and Republicans who are, who are owned by Wall Street, the Wall Street parasites that are dominating and crushing our lives for over 50 years now at least, um, I, I totally support that, and that's what we need, and that's the message I wanted to convey. Like, I'm always on the Workers' Party of Britain's side, I'm always seeing you, and uh, I don't want to call them your acolytes, but the people who are building up that party. And we have to save ourselves, George. That, that's the thing. We have to save ourselves. Nobody's that's coming right. to save us. That's we're, right. going, we're going right back into slavery. And I just wanted to convey that. And I appreciate you. Well, you, you have conveyed it with extraordinary power, as always. Thank you, brother, for that. Uh, Attila is in California. Let's hear from Attila. Go ahead, sir. How you doing, George? We're having a warm day here. Hey, here's what's going on. There's a lot of talk about throwing people in prison, and some people need to be in prison, and some people be, be beneath the ground. But the old boy in Oregon last week that called up and was talking about the scourge up in Oregon over marijuana and how strong it is, uh, I, it just hit me because he was calling for these draconian, uh, actions that let's throw everybody in jail. Well, the next thing you know, you'll be throwing journalists in jail for life for telling the truth if you go that route. And the other thing is, is I did 10 <laughs> well, that's years exactly in, what we're doing. Uh, yes, and I, I did 10 years in prison, federal prison, for possession of marijuana. And I, I just, uh, and, and let me just say this, it, 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 where Julian is now, Oh, my God, where I was was a boys' camp, which it wasn't, and where he will go over here will be damn sure worse than where I was, and I just don't want to see anybody be put in jail for some um, victimless crime if there is such a thing, and that's, uh, that's where I'm coming down today. Very powerful call, uh, Attila. Thanks for making it. Uh, Pepe22 donated five U.S. dollars and says... Sharpest dressed man in journalism. Thank you, Pepe. My wife turns me out well. Chris82 uh, donated £44.99. Chris82, many, many thanks to you. 
David Jessup donated four pounds 49. I'm going to take a quick one minute break and then we're going to talk about Colombia where a rather surprising and important political result emerged in the last 72 hours. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. You have to remember back in 2002, 2003, there was a wish by George Bush for regime change. That's what was driving him. Nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, which of course didn't exist in Iraq. So they had to construct some sort of formula, some sort of cover story, in order to persuade the British public that intervention in Iraq was right. Now David Kelly, uh, as an expert in weapons of mass destruction, knew that uh, this was untrue. He knew that there were probably no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was a guy that could have brought down, that was a guy that could have brought down the whole system. I reckon you're chaff. You've been thrown up to divert uh, our probing. The Foreign Affairs Select Committee, that um, parliamentarian briefing, I think that was an indignity to him. We saw it on the news, and my very first thought was shock. Um, oh, my God, you know, this man is in the eye of the media hurricane. Uh, he should be protected by that, at least. You've got blood on your hands, Prime Minister. Are you going to resign over this? I don't know the details of how Lord Hutton happened to be selected, but what was certainly the case is that he was the right kind of judge to use from the point of view of Downing Street and the intelligence services as well. Of the 21 days of hearing, only one half of one day was spent on discussing the forensic aspects. That is disgusting. We were given the Hutton report the day before it was published, but actually what happened was he went too far. The events of 2003 were disgraceful ones in this country's history, and it's unfinished business. Those responsible for an illegal war, those responsible for the death of David Kelly, have not been brought to justice. There's no, been no inquest into David Kelly's death. There needs to be one. We need to make sure that those who behaved in a reprehensible way in 2003 are finally brought to book. Global Higher Education with one of the world's best-known iconoclasts, the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. So there's 24 tickets left for the showing in Newcastle tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in the Copthorne uh, Hotel, which is a very nice place. Uh, my dear mother, 87 years young, and my late father uh, stayed there, uh, had a wonderful few days there. So I'm looking forward to that. And that's tomorrow night at 7 p.m. I'm traveling to Newcastle. If you are in traveling distance from Newcastle, there's at the last count 24 seats left in the auditorium. Uh, now, in Colombia, the left candidate, a former fighter in the guerrilla army of the poor, the people who fought the fascist military dictatorship in Colombia to a standstill, the people who have resisted the use of their country as a garrison of uh, the US empire, a spearhead against neighboring Venezuela, a threat to the people of their own country to an extraordinary degree. Political activists, trade union activists, social movement activists disappeared and massacred. All of that was the backdrop to an amazing presidential victory for the left-wing candidate in the elections this week. One man who knows, a woman, I beg your pardon, who knows all about it, is Oxford University's finest, Gwen Verniat. Gwen, thanks uh, for joining us. Are you actually in Colombia right now? Yes, I am. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the show. It's an honor uh, for us to have you. Uh, what's the atmosphere like in Colombia in the wake of this result? I think it's, I mean, it's a very exciting time to be in Colombia. Um, there's really an atmosphere of hope and enthusiasm. 
as you mentioned, this is a really significant election. Um, it's the first time that a non-elite candidate has been elected president. And it's significant because it's, Gustavo Petro is, as you mentioned, a left-wing uh, former guerrilla fighter. But he was a former guerrilla fighter from the M19 guerrilla, which actually disarmed in 1991. And he's been doing politics ever since. He's been a mayor of Bogota. He's been a congressman several times. And he was partnered um, with Francia Marquez, his vice presidential formula, who is the Colombia's first ever Afro-Colombian woman to reach high office. And both of them are from uh, conflict affected regions of the country. And um, so it's very exciting for the majority of people in the country who are not elites. This is an extremely unequal country uh, to see people like them um, from more humble backgrounds reach high office and people who are promising change. So I think a large uh, sector of Colombian society today, of course, the majority who voted for him um, and for Marquez are very hopeful and excited um, that this is a chance for change. And that was very much the key message of the campaign uh, was to, to change. Um, there's so much disillusionment with the political system here and various other factors, which I know we're going to talk about. But of course, there's also a, a smaller uh, but nevertheless, some significant number of people who were very concerned um, with Petro's election. Petro is a figure who um, uh, evokes quite a lot of fear in uh, many sectors, even among sectors who are more open to the left. But this is a country with a strong history of kind of Cold War anti-left narratives. Um, but he's, he, he, he evokes a lot of concern for people because people see him as a populist. But I think since he was elected on Sunday, um, so a week ago today, he's managed to send a lot of messages that reassure people. Um, and his message is now very much about overcoming polarization and building dialogue between different sectors to get different sectors around the table from the political parties, from the different sectors of, of society to make the changes that this country so desperately needs um, because it's a country of extreme inequality and that inequality has been um, exacerbated by the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. Um, and so it's a very exciting time to be here. No, but of course, the main, the main question is, uh, well, that, yeah. that was all in campaign. What's it going to look like when he actually starts governing? Yes, uh, of course, uh, you're right to make the point that he was with the M19, not with the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. So he has a longer period, uh, more than 30 years, uh, in the political world rather than in the armed struggle. Uh, against uh, dictatorship. I'm presuming that all the forces of the left got behind him uh, as the most likely candidate to win. And of course, I know there are many people on the right, former supporters of the oligarchy and the dictatorships, uh, who will be terrified of him. But he's not actually all that frightening, is he? Uh, he his declared uh, ideology is he supports democratic capitalism. Chance would be a fine thing, many of us would say, uh, but how sincere is he about that? I think he's sincere about making significant changes to redress the most serious problems of Colombia beyond ideology or beyond um, sort of campaign banners. I think that, that what I think is really important is he's brought together a number of different sectors into this coalition. So he's not governing on his own. I think that's another important point to make. He's um, the leader of a party called Colombia Humana, which is a left-wing party, um, but the platform that has won the government is not just Colombia Humana. Colombia Humana is part of a broader coalition government called Pacto Histórico, which it's all in the name, Historic Pact. Um, so this is a coalition which is made up of many different leftist and center-left uh, parties and also indigenous movements and sectors. Um, but also some centrist figures have joined him in his uh, campaign. And I think this is significant because among those figures who have joined him are several people who formerly were working in the government of Juan Manuel Santos, who was president of Colombia between 2012, uh, 2010 and 2018, and who was uh, the leader of the peace negotiations with the FARC guerrilla, which you've just mentioned, which led to a historic peace deal in 2016, in which the FARC guerrilla um, disarmed, but also this agreement had the roadmap for a series of significant transformations of the structural conditions um, of inequality in the country, the, the, the addressing of which were, were meant to 
uh, prevent future cycles of violence. Um, and so you have a lot of people who are now working with Petro who are former Santistas, but they are really representing the continuance of implementing the peace agreement. And I think that the peace agreement is one of the most important um, things that's at stake with the Petro government. And I think Petro is really sincere about implementing that peace agreement. And that's one of the things which all of the different sectors from the left to the center, who of course have many differences in terms of their vision um, of the economy of the country and of various other things, they all come together around the importance of implementing this peace agreement, which was signed with the FARC in 2016, which doesn't just uh, disarm the guerrilla, but also um, does land reform, increases political participation of a, or the whole of demo the democratic system, addresses the drug trafficking, which has degraded the conflict so much, and provides a series of truth and justice mechanisms to redress the rights of the over 8 million victims of the Colombian armed conflict. And so I think his commitment to implementing that peace deal is really important because the peace deal was rejected in a referendum in 2016. And the people who opposed the peace deal who were the, um, the, the party of the former president, Alvaro Uribe, the Democratic Center Party, they then continued to campaign against the peace deal in order to win the presidential elections of 2018. And the president, who is today President Ivan Duque, uh, was elected on a basis of promising to basically undermine and do away with the peace deal. And so during this four years of government, we have seen the peace deal has been hanging on by a thread. There were various really important advances that were made in 2016, as the FARC disarmed and the first steps of implementation began um, under Santos, but then, uh, and, and in fact, homicides dropped to a 20 year low, but then with Duque's arrival into the presidency, Duque did not implement fully the peace agreement and the insecurity rates have spiraled. So the conflict is now, again, a really significant uh, concern um, in the country. And so a lot of eyes are on Petro as the, the last chance really of saving not only the, the, the minimalist sections of the peace deal in which regard, you know, ending the conflict and just stopping the violence, but also the more maximalist aspirational um, parts of the peace agreement, which have a more redistributive agenda. So everyone is really hoping that he's going to be able to implement this deal. Um, and in order to do that, he does need the support of these different sectors from the left and the center. And he's even now starting to talk to the right. The recent news is that he has invited former President Uribe to uh, a dialogue to address the important things that they can find in common to find solutions for this country's problems. And Uribe has accepted. And so this is a, an, interesting, um, an interesting step towards an era of dialogue instead of uh, polarization, as some people are calling it. I'd take a long spoon uh, if I was uh, the president. Uh, lastly, how has the United States reacted? The United States has reacted really positively, which um, is a really reassuring sign. And so all of those sectors who were very anti-Petro and very afraid of Petro because they were very afraid of the left have been, I think, reassured in this last week. Within two days, uh, Biden uh, phoned Petro and they spoke on the phone about the important um, uh, you know, relationship that they're going to have. Of course, Colombia is America's main ally in the region and has historically been on the right. So this was a kind of a, a touchy subject and the alliance with America is really important um, for all of the things to do with implementing the peace agreement. Um, but I think they, they had a phone conversation um, within two days, whereas Ivan Duque, the current president, had to wait five months to get Joe Biden on the phone. Um, so it shows how serious Joe Biden is. And Joe Biden was a supporter of the peace deal when Obama was president. Um, and so I think he will look favorably on the peace deal. One of the major, um, uh, one of the major challenges is to change the um, attempt, the, the, the approach to drug trafficking, because one of the uh, parts of the peace deal was to tackle drug trafficking with a holistic approach providing crop substitution to four poor farmers who grow coca crops out of necessity giving them ways to transition into legal economies um, and this was a, a, a you know a very carefully constructed policy and it had the support of obama but then ivan duque got into power and trump came into power in the white house and they returned to a much more militarized um, strategy where they were doing forced eradication of crops which is terrible for the environment and um, also treating the poor farmers as criminals. Um, and this has created a lot of unrest. And so the hope is that the uh, drugs agenda is going to return to implementing point four of the peace agreement on the holistic measures around drugs, 
But also Petro has been saying to Biden that one of the important things he wants to work on with the United States is climate change. This is the first time that a Colombian president has been elected with climate change as one of his key promises. And so that the United States is going to be an important ally for that. And it's also an issue that Biden has been enthusiastic about. So uh, let's hope, um, of course, uh, I am cautiously optimistic, uh, knowing all sorts of things can go wrong, uh, but I am, I, I am hopeful that uh, this is a much better chance of getting some good things done in terms of peace and climate change than under a right-wing candidate who could have taken the country really back into a terrible spiral of war. Gwen, you're a natural at this. I hope we have you back. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, let's uh, take as many calls as we can uh, before the end of the show. Yuri is in Virginia. Go ahead, Yuri. George, how you doing, sir? I appreciate the time. You're um, welcome. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> All right, great. Um, it's so much to talk about. There's so much bad stuff going on. I, I can't even begin to start, but I know you were had a great piece on the labor union and them attempting to change the narrative. I guess I just wanted your opinion on how they're able to redirect the conversation away from what the issue is all the time, especially with the fact that the mainstream media, in my opinion, is dead and shows like yours and others that I follow do so much better job uh, presenting the news. Well, Yuri, a very good question. Uh, if I knew I'd, uh, I'd uh, be uh, more successful, uh, if I knew the trick, uh, I might even be running the country if I knew the trick. Uh, uh, first of all, the mainstream media is not dead. We must disavow ourselves of that uh, very satisfying uh, but wrong uh, conclusion. The mainstream media is greatly weakened. Uh, intelligent people like yourself rely on it less and less. But a very large number of people, still a majority uh, of our people in your country and mine, are entirely reliant on the mainstream media. And the mainstream media is bought and sold a hundred times over. So we are, uh, we are still up against it in the, uh, in the scale of media disinformation, misinformation, distortion, lying, and of course, utter censorship. I mean, we complain about social media censorship, but uh, try getting someone like me on the BBC or on uh, MSNBC uh, presenting a show. It's simply impossible. It could never, ever happen. Uh, so uh, it, they're not dead. They're not dead yet. It's not dark yet, but it's getting there, as Bob Dylan would put it. Uh, the second point is that w there's a lot of idiots in the world, uh, especially in your country and mine. Uh, there are a lot of actual idiots. Uh, you had a president, George W. Bush, who was literally inches from being an imbecile. Uh, so there's a lot of idiots and they vote for idiots. Uh, ignorance is bliss for millions of people. There are sheep near my house uh, with more independence of thought and action than millions of our compatriots. So we've got a long way to go. The one thing I'll say, Yuri, there are more people know than have ever known before. And that's why I'm confident that the future is ours. Thanks for the call. Esther in Ayrshire, first Good time evening, caller, sir. is up. Go ahead, Esther. Good evening. Uh, good, uh, long time no speak. It's a pleasure to contribute to your show and to and for your cause. I just wanted to say just something quickly okay. about the uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, uh, yes. Uh, I want to be sensitive because um, I mean it is a very sensitive subject. But personally, I'm actually I, I'm really pleased. I think it's a, I think it's a great day for America. Um, no, I, I, obviously I'm in Britain and our NHS is free at the point of use and in America a lot of women have to pay uh, to even give birth and there's a lot of costs and, and uh, you know, and people get pregnant through different various ways and, and, and I understand that. But I want to say just from where I'm coming from, my mum, she, she gave me up for adoption and even though life hasn't been amazing all the time, I'm thankful that she didn't abort me and... You know, so I, I, Amen. I just, Amen. I, I'm just so grateful that she didn't make 
that decision, you know, and, and, and I was put into a loving family and, and if there's anyone, you know, contemplating it right now, I just I, I just what I just wanna say, you know, just reconsider it. There's people out there that, that, that could love the child, there's there's families that, that, that want to to uh to you know, to raise a child that they can have on their own and so I I, I just plead with people, you know, and I, I'm just so thankful my mum didn't abort me. Um, I was adopted and I've met her. What a beautiful and call. And she's a lovely woman. But um, just as there's anybody contemplating it, I just, just reconsider because there's people out there that could love your child and could raise them and give them a good life, you know. And... Um, and they can end up on the mother of all talk shows, speaking so beautifully. Thanks, yeah. Esther, uh, for that. Lord Charfield donated £4.49. Thank you, my lord. Hi, George. Loving the show. I'm a Workers' Party member. Our first lord. Which unions do you recommend for NHS workers that are not affiliated with the TUC and Labour? Uh, I don't know any that are not affiliated with the TUC. Uh, and I don't know any that are in the NHS that are not affiliated with Labour. I suggest that you join UNITE, formerly the Transport and General Workers Union, which does organise in the National Health Service. Thank you, my lord. And Chuck is in San Diego. Who wouldn't? Go ahead, Chuck. It's always a pleasure to speak to you and your audience, George, but it is a challenge. You and they are worldly wise and well informed. So I try and keep my comments relevant, factual, informative, and succinct. I'll leave that to you to decide. Now on Roe v. Wade, I have two comments, one in the form of a comment and the second in the form of a lesson. First is that the hypocrisy of both sides has become apparent in that the people who are pro-choice uh, and bodily autonomy were also pro-vaccine mandate, and the people who are pro-life uh, are were for body autonomy and against vaccine mandates. That's kind of strange and needs to be pointed out. The second is the lesson. In an era of divine rights of kings to rule, the American Constitution was unique. Harking back to the English common law and Magna Carta of 1215, the Constitution enumerated and established the limits of government power vis-a-vis -vis its citizens. It became the supreme law of the land and the Supreme Court the final arbiter of its meaning. Last time I discussed the activist, activist conservative justice who ruled with a twisted and pressed logic that corporations were people and money equaled speech, though neither even intimated in the language of the Constitution. But activism works both ways. Today, when people speak of justice as politics, they are labeled as either liberal or conservative, but that only pertains to the social and cultural issues. Otherwise, they are in lockstep as they like the attorney general, the chief officer of the uh, United States, uh, are drawn to the ranks of the elite from corporate law firms. There was a time, however, when the distinctions were valid. In 1966, the liberal left-leaning court of Earl Warren decided in Miranda v. Arizona, and in 1973, the activist Warren Burger Court decided Roe v. Wade respectively. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, meaning if a person violates the law, the fact they didn't know is no defense, but it cuts both ways. Ignorance of your rights preclude an ability to assert them, making it as if you have no right. Regarding the Miranda decision in 1966, the Warren Court looked to the Fifth Amendment's right against self-incrimination to infer the right to remain silent. This led to the ubiquitous Miranda warning, you have the right to remain silent. Confessions and otherwise strong court cases were thrown out due to the lack of Miranda. Reversing that decision, Judge Alito ruled that you may have the constitutional right against self-incrimination, but no constitutional right to be advised of that. With 1973 Roe case, the court struck down a Texas statute that criminalized abortion as too restrictive and against a woman's right to choose and her privacy, implying a right from the language of the Bill of Rights. 
In overturning Roe, the court ruled the original decision was egregiously wrong and created a right not in the Constitution. Relying on the Tenth Amendment, known by the moniker of states' rights, that relates all powers not expressly given to the federal government are reserved to the states. With trigger laws in place, the result of the ruling will be a patchwork of uh, desperate state laws where a woman's rights will depend on what state she resides in and her financial wherewithal. So much for the United States of America. A couple of other rulings. Well, it is a federal, uh, it is a federal country, uh, Chuck. It is not a unitary state. The 50 states of the Union have all kinds of powers to have, in some cases, radically different uh, policies and laws uh, concerning gun ownership and, uh, and so on, and many uh, other things. Anyway, thanks for that tutorial. I feel almost I'm a qualified American lawyer. Now, thanks, Chuck. Kenny is in Acton on the Elvis biopic. I knew that Kenny would have seen it. Go ahead, Ken. Hi, George. Yeah, I've seen it on Friday, and I was absolutely blown away. What a fantastically yeah. directed film. Everything about it, the cinematography was kind of surreal. The cinematography was very artistic, and there was bits with the montages, and it's in slow motion, and Elvis's singing voice is an echo, and it was kind of like I was watching an animation in a strange way. You know, almost like, Tim Burton had directed it in a strange sense, but you know that's probably the wrong comparison. And I, I'm really actor, looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. And yeah. Actor, how does he play? Does he look like Elvis? He's got different eyes, but I've got a theory as to why they intentionally chose an actor who never looked too much like Elvis. That is because they would worry that he would become typecast and find it hard to get another role. Well, that guess that's the guy who looks like Elvis, and you know. But uh, Austin, he got the same lips as him, and obviously the hair and his movements, his dancing, is doing an absolute T. It was absolutely brilliant, and I feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. And it, there's a nice little surprise at the end as well. And I heard the woman two rows yeah, behind me. I'm not going to tell you. I heard a woman, a woman two rows behind me and a, a long about sobbing, you know, and it felt really comfortable. You know, there was someone in the, their audience that was moved to tears. I had to fight the tears back, actually. You know, my eyes watered, but they never rolled in my cheeks. Yeah, and I want to see the film again. Well, that's funny you say that, Kenny, and thanks for the call. I need to okay. stop you short of a song because I have some closing remarks to make, but my very good friend, Sean O'Donnell, who is a real man's man, not the crying type, uh, and he was greatly moved by it uh, also. Uh, and he also wanted to go back and see it uh, again. Uh, I wanted just a minute or so, it's all I have, uh, to uh, point out that on this day in 1950, uh, the Korean War was launched. Uh, the Korean War is long forgotten. There's no journalist alive today uh, that is still at work and still remembers and references uh, the Korean War. No politician ever talks about it. Uh, the Vietnam War uh, is headed in the same direction to historical oblivion, uh, not even remembered, never mind learned from. Uh, so I wanted to be the antidote to that. Because it is very important that you know that the deep enmity that exists in the East against the West is in part motivated by the memory of the Korean War. In 1950, the United States and Great Britain and Australia and many other Western countries launched a devastating, annihilating, nihilistic, genocidal attack on the people of Korea, all to maintain a false partition of a small peninsula in the interests of 
hatred of the Soviet Union and the hatred of the People's Republic of China, which had only just come into being. In the course of the Korean War, the West killed 20% of the entire population of Korea. One in five Koreans was killed by the United States and Great Britain and Australia and other countries. Not a single building higher than one story high was left standing in Korea at the end of the war. We've run out of targets, said General Curtis LeMay, uh, the mass murderer-in-chief on the Korean Peninsula. So, when the next time you hear about North Korean paranoia, when the next time you hear about North Korean missiles and the armed encampment which North Korea has become. Remember that one in every five of all Koreans was killed by us in the lifetime of Elvis. As a matter of fact, Elvis was already on the stage when we were murdering Koreans in their millions. Thank you very much indeed for joining me tonight. I have thoroughly enjoyed the show. I hope that you did also. And if you did, join me on Wednesday on YouTube for The Galloway Show, a no-budget television alternative to the mother of all talk shows. Good night and thank you.